All right. Hello. Hi. Um, this again. Welcome to part 22 of this. What is this? I hear you ask. This is me writing a WebAssembly interpreter. Um, I'm doing that mainly to have fun. I'm also doing it to demystify WebAssembly for myself and for you maybe, and I'm doing it to share how I do it. For better or worse, you can see how I go about this ridiculous task. Um, so I'm trying to do it in Ruby. Um, so my sort of the principles I'm trying to deploy here are that I want to prioritize having fun over making something that, you know, is a complete implementation of the WebAssembly standard. I'm trying to prioritize correctness uh, over speed. I'm trying to prioritize clarity over cleverness. I'm trying to do it in pure Ruby, going okay so far. Um, and I'm trying to do it in no dependencies, which is going okay so far. Now, uh, what I always do at this point is have a little self-indulgent retrospective uh, where I think about what happened last time. Um, I don't really think very much about what happened last time. I mean, I'm, I'm at a bit of a sort of a transitional point at the moment. I didn't so much like finish what I was doing last time as just sort of run out of time. So, you know, there's not a nice, not really anything clever I can say about what happened last time. I mean, the two observations I have are that number one, um, I crossed over the 100 hour mark last time. Um, it's not clear to me whether it's a good or a bad thing that I've already generated so many hours of video and, you know, don't have that much to show for it. But either way, it's definitely a thing. So, seems worth mentioning. Um, the other thing is that I'm, like, last time I spent a fair amount of time getting the AST parser ready for some major surgery, and then I started the major surgery of threading an identifier context through all of its guts. So, and then, as I said, I, I just sort of got sleepy and ran out of time, and so I stopped. So, even though I'm mightily sick of working on the AST parser for the moment, I don't really want to leave it in that condition. Um, not least because I think it'll be difficult to go back to. So, I think my goal for today will be sort of to land that transition, you know, like get it... <sighs> as far as possible, get that done. Just be done with identifiers in the interpreter, if at all possible. Like, no more identifiers in the interpreter. Everything's just an index. Um, you can take the names out of the AST. Everything gets a lot simpler. Um, obviously, that is sort of optimistic. Um, if it gets too hairy, then I'll try... Well, I'll try to stop somewhere safe where it's not half broken and then switch over to doing something more fun in the interpreter instead. And then I can always come back to the parser at some later point. But I would really like to just get this interpreter, get this uh, identifier context stuff done so that I don't ever have to think about it again. Um, so I think that's the, that's essentially the substance of the retro. I don't have much more to say than that. Um, so we can get started. Uh, looking at the code. I'm just going to rerun the test to reassure myself that nothing has gone wonky on my uh, on my computer in the in the interim. Um, I think I can do some, you know, this so-called plan for the next stream that's become a little bit, um, well, it's not that it's not a plan for the next stream, it's just that it's become a little bit, uh, a little bit either more or less than that. This is basically just what I'm doing at the moment. So I did all this. I did extract some helpers. I combined parsing and unfolding. That was great. Um, I did begin to introduce an identifier context. This is the big, this is the thing I've been avoiding is looking up local variables in an identifier context. So maybe I'll start with that today. Um, the reason I've been shying away from it is that I think local variables are possibly the most complicated because 
they are local variables get introduced by locals in a function definition. They also get introduced by the inline params in a function definition, but they also also get introduced by the type defs. And so maybe this is all going to be totally straightforward, but it just seems to me that there's a lot of potential for this to flush out things I haven't thought about yet or I haven't dealt with. Basically, I haven't really done anything to do with types yet. So uh, that's why I'm nervous about this. It's not inherently difficult, or at least it doesn't seem inherently difficult, but I'm just aware that there are actually several moving pieces in the, you know, if you want to answer the question of what local variables exist in the body of a function, it's not totally straightforward. It depends on the semantics of type defs, all of this business around synthesizing new type defs if there isn't one that matches already and the fact that the inline ones are just an abbreviation and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm, I feel a little bit, I'm a little bit worried that's gonna be a rabbit hole. Oh yeah, the spec test module, I think that's pretty low priority really, but if I wanted to get the global dot wast test passing, that would be a good way of doing it. Uh, yeah, account for trading label correctly, I've done that. Um, not so worried about having a nice module object. I'm gonna move that down feels that will happen at some point when I need it uh, should I use repeatedly when I care about the return value that's really just like a refactoring question um, I think these I'm going to put these in a separate section um, reduce duplication between parse parameter parse result parse local so I mean, I think this is actually sort of two things and I sort of cheated by checking it off because I think parse parameter without the S on the end. Yeah, there is still duplication between those things. I mean, I, I don't... I don't think this is a big deal, really. Again, it's sort of more of a refactoring. So I, I've, I've done this one. I haven't done that. So I'll move this down into my, uh, let's call this leisurely parser refactoring. So I'm not gonna, I'm by definition not feeling very much pressure to actually do that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, these, I think these two are also leisurely parser, le leisurely parser refactoring stuff. None of that is really on the critical path. Um, of course, Chris's PR is very much on the critical path. That's by far the most exciting thing to happen to this project. And it's, uh, I was going to say in its short life, but I suppose it's at least 100 hours old now. So maybe not so short. Um, and yeah, I'd like to, this has sort of been a, I mean, I don't mean it's a chore, but what I mean is it's kind of a chore in as much as it's just a job that needs to be done. Um, it doesn't yield any immediate results, but I think having some contribution guidelines will help set expectations in the future. Um, clearly, I need to <laughs> I need to set expectations about how long it will take me to get to uh, get to any PR because my well, I've done a terrible job in both cases with both the folks and Chris's PR, so I need to make that clear. Um, right. So, okay, well, enough, uh, waffle. Let's start thinking about what is involved in getting the local variables out of an identifier context. Um, so I guess there's a local dot get and a local dot set. So this is, it's sort of in here is where I'm doing the sort of using the identifier context, right? Um, so at the moment, if it's a get or set of a global, then I look it up in context.globals. If it's calling a function, I look it up in context.functions. And I think, did I do that for indirect calls as well? Y yes, implicitly. Yeah, that's right. So I, f I, I made it so that when you're making a list of elements, that I think these are always function references, um, then we look those IDs up. I don't actually don't know if that's right. It's like, shouldn't we be accounting for the possibility that it's, that it's already numeric? <laughs> but whatever, um, that's not, 
I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Um, no, the tests are broken yet, so it can't be that big a deal. Anyway, the point is, I think local.get, local.set, and local.t should be looking in context.locals, index, index, or raise. Now, I don't even have that yet. So that's not going to survive very long, is it? Context.locals, no such thing. Okay. Um, well, at least context is available. So yeah, I'm going to do the usual thing here, I think, where it's just like, I'm just going to keep bouncing off the error in the in this acceptance test and see what I have to flesh out to make it pass. Right now, the problem is that this context object doesn't have a, doesn't have locals. Um, maybe I'll look at the, I can bring up the spec web assembly because there's a bit in this text format section about the identifier context and I wonder if I can somehow like these are in some order I guess I was just doing it in alphabetical order here but that seems to coincide with <laughs> with what's in here uh, uh, as far, you know, in as much as their funks is before globals, and those are the two that I've already done. So I think I might fill these in sort of in the order that they appear here. Yeah, I don't really know what this order means. I don't think it means anything, but this is just the order that they've chosen to identify to, to introduce the bits, so that's good enough for me. Um, so... What's the point of this? The point is locals go after globals. So locals and uh, sort of the same again, but like that. Okay. And then this should, I, I, I think this was the last thing I did last time was that I made this sort of generic over the index spaces. So just adding it as an attribute of the data class should be enough for it to be able to combine them okay so now this is going to say i couldn't find it right so this is raising because it can't find whatever local it was looking up so so yeah what we've got to do is whereas so yeah if, again if we look in the spec um I was in the right place. Um, this bit here about the initial identifier context. So this is the build identifier. Is that what it's called? Oh, build initial context. Yeah, okay. And it was build I. Um, so this is our implementation of this function from the spec that's like essentially given a list of fields. How do you populate the initial like uh, identify context for that module and that's incorporating the names that are bound by the function definitions and the table definitions and the global definitions and stuff like that but of course there aren't any local definitions in here because locals are not defined at the module level they're defined inside functions or at least that's the main place that they're declared so um, so what we need to do is not add it to the initial context and it doesn't really need to be, we don't need anything in here actually. Like this is just gonna inherit the, or it's just gonna get the empty locals context from by not specifying anything about um, what locals it wants. So it'll just get the empty list. So we need to do, I imagine in parse function, Yeah, so this isn't going to, it's not like this is going to, um, I, I just had a moment of terror where I was like, does this need to return a context? But the answer is no, it just needs to, having parsed the locals here and the parameters, um, this is all on the assumption that we're looking at an inline type use. Um, so again, let's go to the function syntax here. So the assumption is, Oh, this code is assuming, I think it will just be nil if not, but we're assuming it's that the type use here is this sort of inline parameter and result declaration because normally this type use is like the type keyword 
followed by the index of a type def. Um, so this is sort of the canonical way of explaining what the type of a function is, is you say this type use is normally just referring to a type def and then the type def will say, um, well, where do we see it here? Um, it'll have one of these func types and the func type will say there are this many params of these types and then this many results of these types. So this is essentially giving, this is sort of describing a function type. Um, these are the params, these are the results. Um, but I think for now, what I'm gonna do, I mean, I think I got away for a really long time with just parsing these in line. So I think at least the first chunk of tests should pass just thinking about the parameters and the locals because yeah, what happens is that inside, I'm not sure where this shows up in the, oh yeah, here, here's where it shows up. I was just gonna say inside a function body, the locals are, well, actually let's have a look. Sorry, I'm, I'm not being articulate. Um, invoke function is the relevant place. So in the operational semantics, which is, you know, what we're trying to predict, what we're trying to anticipate, um, at runtime, what happens when you call a function is that we get all of the parameter names for the function and we also get all the locals, the local names for that function. And then the list of locals becomes all the parameters plus all the locals. So if the function took three parameters and you've also declared that there are two local variables for the function, then you get five locals, right? So the parameters just show up as local variables. So I think what that means is that here, we need to extend this context. Like when we go into parse instructions, just like, oh, I've closed it now. Just like here where we, like parameters is actually, this is sort of an association list that's giving the, you know, because we don't have these indexes yet, we have to keep the names around. So this is making an association list of all of the names and values of the parameters. This is all the names and values of the locals. And then we, smush them together um, and we pass them in to evaluate expression, right? So we need to do the sort of corresponding thing here, which is to smush all the locals and parameters together, the names of them, uh, some of which are gonna be nil because the names are optional, but we, you know, we need to know sort of what, what position each one is in, even if it's padded out by nils. Uh, any any of them that's got a name has to assume the right position in this in this array. So we've got a pad. So maybe I can just do locals equals. What does parse locals return? I, I guess it returns an array of these local AST nodes. Yeah. So. I mean, at least for now, I need to not mess with what's currently happening here. Um, let me just think this through. So it's something like local IDs equals parameters map. I mean, if, are these are these all the same? What happens is in parse type use. Uh, parse parameters. So we get whatever parse parameters returns. And we get whatever parse parameter returns, which is a parameter, right? Um, so here parameter has got a name, local has got a name. So we can just treat those as we can treat those identically, I think. I think we can just do parameters plus locals to get the overall list of them um, and then just map name over them. And that will give us, again, some of them will be nils, but some of them will actually have a name. Uh, and then, 
Okay. Well, I'm just thinking, sorry, I'm just thinking about, you know, we need to, we need to make one of these and then combine it with the existing context. Um, so maybe this is like local context or locals context. And then here, when we call parse instructions, we're not parsing, we're not passing in the same context that we got. We're passing in that context plus the locals context. Maybe I should call it body context. Yeah, because that's, oh no, hold on, because that's the, yeah, it's okay. I've got to compute this. I've got to do this adding somewhere and I either do it in line here or I do it in the assignment to this local. And I think maybe this is slightly clearer. So that's my very simple minded attempt. I mean, at the moment we haven't even been able to parse i32.wast. So um, why don't I try running that on its own and see what happens? Okay, not good. Yeah, good point, Ruby. I'm not sure what I thought I was doing there. Basically, I wasn't thinking. Hey! Okay, so that simple-minded approach has at least got us somewhere. <laughs> so that's good. Um, let me just... I just want to sense-check this by saying... Uh, Let's just see some debug code. So looking up index in context.locals. Uh, inspect. Let's inspect both of these. Just in case there are nils or whatever. Okay. So that's good. It's working as far as it as far as that goes. Um, and like I said, I would sort of hope that most of the early tests should work under this regime. It's just that I know that there are some, because we had to implement type defs, I know that there are some that only get the function type indirectly. This is getting a long way though. Right, okay, so as predicted, func.wast. See, that's strange because these these lookups are all fine, right? In fact, this this isn't erroring out at all. It's just giving the wrong answer. What the hell is this? Bracket bracket f. Oh. Oh, okay. I think this is pretty print, which has sort of passed its sell by date, to be honest. Um, let's try and find this in the uh, func.west. But yeah, I think uh, when I. When I changed it, when I separated out the AST parsing from the interpreter, I didn't change the pretty print function, so it thinks it's still printing an S expression. So I think this is I think this is it trying to print AST nodes, but it's just printing them in an extremely confusing way. <laughs> it's making them look like an S expression, which is not very helpful if I'm honest. Um, okay, so this is there's some function called F. Okay, this looks like it, doesn't it? Invoke F with 42. Oh, the 32 is right, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's a 32-bit integer. So I think the I think this is the const instruction, and the attributes that it has are what's the type, how many bits, what's the underlying number? And that's you know, it's integer, it's 32, and the number is zero. So yeah, that is what it is, but that's undesirable, I would say. Uh so let's
let's have a look at pretty print and make that and do the right thing. The reason I was pausing is that I'm a Oh, right. So I was a bit confused about this because I was like, part of the p part of what's good about data, uh, data dot define a b c, is that if I make my foo that's a foo, then it's not enumerable. So I can't say dot each or I can't say to array, like which. I think is an improvement over struct because it avoids situations where you sort of accidentally, you know, you thought you were dealing with an array or an enumerator or something, and actually it was just a struct that happens to be enumerable. Like, I think it's better for it to be strict like this, but then uh, it felt like this was exactly the kind of situation that that was designed to avoid. And I was confused about why it was happening, but I realize now that it's using deconstruct. So, <laughs> because it's appearing in a pattern match, in an array pattern, uh, it gets, sends deconstruct to it. So that's why we're seeing this integer 3242 is because when it gets matched against this array pattern here, quite rightly, it gets blasted apart into its component pieces. So I think I'm just gonna change this to say like AST. Um, Uh, but how's this supposed to work? I mean, f could just be ast.inspect. Like, I don't really need, I don't really need pretty print at all anymore, to be honest. Um, is there any way that I can make this more pleasant? And I think it's basically fine. Like, the, it's not it's not particularly beautiful, but I would rather see what I'm seeing now than something that looks like an S expression because that's super confusing. So I think I'm going to leave it like this for now rather than get rid of pretty print entirely because I might want to come back and do something nicer than that. Um... What does PP look like? I mean, maybe. No, this is fine. So let's say, uh, use inspect to pretty print ASTs in the interpreter. And then I'll just say, uh, this isn't very beautiful, but at least it doesn't look confusingly like an S expression. Uh, I should have updated this method when I switched the interpreter away from the S expressions. Well, switch the interpreter to use AST nodes instead of. Okay. Fine, all right. Well, that's not a very earth shattering change, but it's something that needed doing. Um, okay. So yeah, assert return, invoke, f. So why is this failing? So we're calling f with the argument 42. We're expecting the answer to be zero, but instead we're getting 42. So somehow f is acting like the identity function, but it's supposed to return zero. I mean, I. The temptation is to believe that this test is designed specifically to catch whatever situation we're in here, but that's not necessarily the case. So what does F do? Uh, oh, it's actually this one. 
the previous one is from a different module. Right, yeah, so this is indeed what I was worried about. So this doesn't have, okay, yeah, so what's going on is that this doesn't have any inline uh, type at all. It, so it's just referring to a type def. So at the moment, what we're doing is treating f as though it's a function that has no arguments, no parameters, I should say. And it's got one local and so how's this returning 42 um I'm not sure I fully understand what's going wrong here. Why does this return the 42? It doesn't think that it has any parameters. Oh, okay. Well, I suppose that it's not returning 42. It's just that that 42 never gets, never gets popped off the upper end stack would be my assumption. This pushes it on, and then when we do invoke function, because we don't think this has any params, we don't pop any params off the operand stack. Um, so yeah, we get the, again, this is names, but we get the parameters, and then however many of them there are, we pop that many off the stack. So in this case, it will be none. We don't pop anything off the stack. This returns some uninitialized local variable. I can't remember whether that whether we initialize these to zero or what, but I don't know. Whatever value this gets, I think gets thrown away when the function's returned because it doesn't. We we didn't pick up it having any result types, any any result type either. Um, so really, this function call doesn't affect the stack at all, and so we end up reading this forty two that was on the top of the stack and not this zero I suppose um, oh yeah oh stop it Siri um, yeah I guess it's this zero here right yeah so okay that does make sense um, so the solution to that he says panicking is to actually look up how are we gonna do this So I think the intention is, you know, there's superficially there's a problem because parse function at this point we don't have access to the rest of to the containing module. Um, we're just parsing this function sort of standalone, and the only thing we've got is the context. So superficially or at least currently there's no way for us to reach up and having seen this uh having seen this reference to a type def there's nowhere for us to get it from but i think that these type defs are supposed to be in the identifier context so that we can do that i think the design here is correct. I think that you're supposed to be able to parse a function in isolation and the context is supposed to, the, the identifier context is supposed to supply all of the context that you need to successfully do that. Um, so let's see if that's true. Yes, so I'm not, I don't yet properly understand why What's going on here? What, I'm, what I was going to say, what I don't understand why is why this contains types and type defs. I guess they're sort of broken apart somehow. Like types keeps track of. Let's look at the let's look at that initial context because that is usually a good indication of what the heck's going on. So this is saying. Right. 
Okay, so that, yeah, this is sort of exactly what I was saying. So when we find this type, when we see type uh, $sig, and then we've got this function type, and this is when we're constructing the initial context, what we need to do is both remember, effectively remember the index of that identifier so that if anyone tries to refer to this name, we've got a way of translating it into an offset so into an index so here we're going to want to translate this into one i suppose because dollar sig is the is the idea of the oneth type def in this module and then once we've got that i assume we're supposed to use the same index to look into this type defs index space to pull out the actual function type so this func type is made of like, oh, we haven't really thought about this, have we? Anyway, I mean, the, the thing that this immediately makes me wonder is like, do I, do I have to store these separately or can I just keep them together? Like they come together um um maybe it's better if i separate them out it's just that i'm going to need some representation of this function type i guess so when we get this func type i'm just going to have to find a way to store it it's like params and results but maybe you know i can just be a two element array or something for now uh i'm sure i can hack something together so the um game plan here is uh add type ids to initial to the types index space of the initial context add function types to the type defs index space of the initial context. Uh, these have the same, well like, each of these has the same index as the optional type ID which introduced it. So like this is going to be, this is going to be type ID index one, and then this is going to be type def index one. So when we found the index of the type, we can use that to dereference into the type defs to, to pull out the one that we need. And then when parsing a function, look up the index of the type ID in the types index space and then when parsing a function look up the type def in uh, well look up the function type in the type defs index space using the index of the type id and then uh, combine the resulting type with whatever inline inf type information exists somehow. Maybe we can just ignore that if there's a type reference. I remember reading something in the spec about if you've got both, then they have to match arity wise and type wise but then you you basically ignore the inline ones except that you use the names because you can't put names in these type defs whereas you can put names in the sort of inline params and stuff so i have to cross that bridge when we come to it here that 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 is not a problem here because we don't have any anything in line um so yeah, okay, let's just work through this one at a time. I mean, I'm 
I'm out on the tightrope a little bit here because my, the tests aren't passing. Um, but they're not catastrophically failing. We're just getting the wrong answer. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pulling on this thread for a little bit and see how far I can get by just following this plan. So it's a good job I wrote it down because I've already forgotten what I need to do. Add type IDs to the types index space of the initial context. Right. So build initial context. Right, so <laughs> here we're not doing anything, um, but we need to actually do something. So let's just look at what the syntax of this is. Uh, type ID and then func type, and the ID is optional, so I'm not even trying to read that at the moment separately. Um, so that's the, that's the type ID. I don't know why I've called this name. It should just be called ID, but whatever. Um, So ultimately, just to remind myself, what I'm going to say here is types contains the name and type defs contains, what's it called, func type. So I've got a, I've, cons I, I've retrieved the name already, um, but now it's like create func type whatever that looks like. Um, so func type is gonna be func. So, okay, I'm just gonna look at the syntax of this because I think this is one of those situations where there's all sorts of abbreviations. So the definition in fact it looks like there aren't any abbreviations for the definition there are this a world of pain all of this oh, this is very painful but um but the actual definition it looks like you're actually quite constrained in what you can say syntactically so that's good so it's type and then an optional id and then this func type which looks like uh, read list starting with func do uh, oh, and then it's like read params, read results. So parameters equals parse parameters. Yeah, that repeatedly tries to read lists starting with param. Yeah. So that's what I want, actually. Um, and then results is parse results. So that's, I'm glad I had those. Uh, that's cool. Um, and then there is no repeatedly read because that's going to be the end. Let's just say func type is nil for a second. Well, I mean, it can be anything. Yeah, let's make it nil because I just want to see what effect this has on the test. What I'm looking for is, it f is for it to not blow up. Okay, yeah, I've forgotten to add type defs to the context. Um, so type defs was right in the end. I don't know if it's valuable to do this really. No one cares what order these things are in. Uh, okay, so let's let's run it again. Why is this blowing up? Unknown keyword types. Oh yeah, okay. We don't even we don't even have types. All right. Well, that's for reasons best known to the people in charge of WebAssembly, types goes at the beginning. Okay, that's what I was looking for, is like, for it to get no worse. So, I assume now, now we can safely populate this with, for now I'll just do a two element array. I don't, 
I, I'm not in love with that as an idea. Yeah, in fact, I'm really not in love with it. Let's make it a hash instead. I mean, really, I should have some kind of value object for this, but let's just see how far we can get with this. Hmm, good point. So let's say this is func type. I mean, this should be parse func type, right, that does this. That's something we can extract in a minute. Uh, unhandled exception. Uh, oh. Poo. Right, so my clever general, let's, com let's write, <laughs> this is exactly the kind of thing that I'm always saying I shouldn't do, um, and last time I decided to do this even though I only had a couple of these things to compose, but you can see that composing Plugging together the values of all of these things is different from plugging together the values of these. Although it is just a, is just a vector of things. So what's the problem? Is it that it can't take the intersection? Uh, let's see this left intersection. Let's get the key here. So we're going to see what the intersection of these two. Well, so it's going to be left inspect plus right inspect equals. Oh, this is. Um, Watch these for intersection ampersand. Um, and let's inspect this. Oh, right. Well, why is that? No, maybe that's not really an oh right situation. Why is that happening? So this is this has worked successfully for a load of for a load of uh, contexts containing type DAFs, but then Um, I just don't entirely understand why this has happened. Uh, yeah, why is it even trying to compose? How is it? It must be that we're going through the fields in a module and we're accumulating. Yeah, obviously, because that's, well, that's one of the places that we use that sort of identifier context composition operation. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to... Not sure how to identify at what point this is going wrong. Maybe if I just print out the S expression at this point, well, it will give us a vague clue of how far it gets. Type sig func, func dummy. So it does look like this is failing 
on the very first module in this file. So it's composing for types, empty and sig. Why is it not? Why is proc not even showing up there? I don't, I don't really understand what's going on here. Um, let's do that again. Oh, it's, it's this, it's this one, isn't it? Okay, type sig func, fine. Uh, Oh, right, because this is, okay, all right, hold on. It does, it, it runs through all of them for every. So let's just make a, let's make a blank line to separate these so that we can see the. Okay, so sig, fine, dummy, fine. Function with no name, so that's this nil, that's fine. Um, another function with no name, that's just nil, so that's fine. Function called f, that's fine. Function called h, that's fine. Uh, you can see we're building up this list of functions now, and we've, we've got this type, and we've got this type def. So that's the situation we're in right now, is that we've got one type def, that is like the empty function type. Is there somewhere down here that we get? Yeah, so why is that okay? Why is it okay for us to have another one that is also an empty function definition? An empty function type. Like, is the idea that we're supposed to treat that in the, in the same way that we're treating nil for the other ones? Like, why why is it okay for that to be duplicated let's look at the well formedness condition okay well it's just I think this is just a subtlety of the wording of how well formed this is defined, right? Because it says some grammar productions are indexed by an identifier context that records the declared identifiers in each index space. Space. In addition, the context records the types defined in the module so that parameter indices can be computed for functions. That's what we're trying to do right now. So really what it's saying is these are all of the identifiers and then also we keep track of the, the type definitions. And then it says an identifier context is well formed if no index space contains duplicate identifiers. So effectively, I think what that means is this, <laughs> these type defs are exempt. They're not part of the well formedness condition. So we shouldn't be comparing, we shouldn't be caring about type defs so that's sort of annoying isn't it so i well really i regret writing this generic thing of me here but let's say raise and less key is <laughs> type defs or left intersection, right compact, empty. Just think about what way round I want that conditional to go. I think I want it to go the other way around. Uh, why? I don't know. I 
I suppose the the key being type defs is sort of the exception rather than the rule, I suppose. You know, that's that's the most of the cases we want to do this first check. And then it's only if that first check fails that we want to have this fallback that says, oh, is it is it type defs? Because that's fine. Okay, anyway, let's see if that's... Okay, right, good. So again, still not working, which I wasn't expecting it to work, but it's no worse. Um, so we've added the type IDs, we've added function types of, of some description to the type desk index space of the initial context. And then, yeah, they they get added together. Um, so the indices are going to line up because we're appending this array to the types and we're appending this array to the type def. So they're just going to go in lockstep with each other. I think this is the only way that either of those can get into those arrays. So now we've got to actually consume this information. Um, oops. So now that that's, so what have we got to do? Uh, to do look up type index in the identifier context. Now, maybe arguably that should be done inside parse type use, I think. I think we should be doing name lookups like as early as possible. So I think maybe this, maybe parse type use needs the context. Um, And we get the index here. And I don't know if we're... How do we normally look stuff up? Yeah, like I said, it sort of looks quite a lot like we're just unconditionally looking things up in the context, which is not great, is it? because it might, oh no, this is inside if index is a string. So here, this is fine. We've already read it in and then we sort of option, you know, conditionally, we will try and look it up in the context. But like here, for example, we are just indiscriminately looking up in the context. So actually I think this is the only problematic place. These are all fine because we've guarded it inside if index is a string. Um, so I just need to do the same thing here. If type index is a string, then type index equals, okay, so this gets a context, uh, context dot types dot index. <laughs> type index. Is that what we did in these other places? Yeah. I mean, really, this should just be index, shouldn't it? Because it's, we don't need that prefix here. We're inside a type use. We understand that that's what it is. Um, So that looks it up in the that looks it up in the context. Um, I suppose I need to do a, a fail fast here because index won't. So again, let's see. Has that broken it? No. Okay. Good. So that index is being dereferenced. I mean, really, really, I need to push. Um, push context lookup. Uh, I 
was going to say into parse index, but it doesn't know what index space it is. Need to pass in context and index space. Or maybe just the value of the index space. You know, you could just pass in context.types into parse index like it doesn't need to know which index space it's looking in it just needs an array but i think centralizing this logic about if you've read an integer then it's already you don't doesn't need to be dereferenced but if it's a string then you do need to look it up in the in, in an index space in the context it'd be nice to kind of wrap that up in one place um okay look up the index of the type id in the types index space done when parsing a function, look up the function type in the type def's index space using the index of the type ID. Right. So now that I've got the type index, so it's like unless type index is nil, then I need to get the type def. So it's gonna be like func type equals context dot type defs dot index type index no that's the wrong way around it's slice type index because i've already this is already an uh, an index yeah my <sighs> the naming of all the local variables that leaves a lot to be desired um rename index name id etc <laughs> local variables to make it more obvious what kind of value we're dealing with at each point because at the moment you can't even do the sort of dimensional analysis by lo looking at this code to try and figure out like what's it actually doing because the local variables don't have even vaguely meaningful names so I think that what I'm going to say here, well, the simplest thing, right, is to say parameters. Well, let's. I'll do it with a. I'll do it with with this. Basically, if we're given a type index, then oh no, because I need the names. I need the names. So there's a there's a weird Sorry, I'm just thinking about what it is that I want to do here. There are two different things that we need these parameters and results for. We need them to extend the context. And we need that primarily to get the right names into the context, but we also need all the offsets to be correct. So uh, um trying to think about all the different cases we need to deal with here basically we need to deal with like only one of them is present or neither of them is present or both of them is present you know either we've got the inline types the abbreviation or we've only got the reference to a type def or we've got both and we might have neither i mean if we've got neither then that's fine we'll just have we'll just have empty arrays um we do need the names in here if they're present i 
think what I'm going to do is compute the local names separately. I think I'm going to wait until I've got all the locals. So I'm going to say if type index is nil, then do one thing, else do another thing. Like local names equals. In this case, if we haven't been given a type index, then the only way of getting names for the parameters is from whatever was provided in line. And if there weren't any, then fine, we haven't got any. But then it's going to be just parameters. Well, it's just going to be this. So that's the kind of the default case. What do I do in this case? I think I think I need to I think I do need to do something like this. I don't really like the string func type. I should just spell it out and call it function type or something. Um yeah, I'll do that. So function type equals, oops, context.type test or slice dot type index. So now I've got to try and find a way to, if there are any names available to me. So if I've learned some names of parameters up here, I need to use them down here. But if I haven't, I just have to use the right number of nils because it's you can't just leave the parameters out because they're the things that put the locals in the right place. Um, but equally, if I haven't been given any inline parameters, then it's sort of the the reason the test is failing at the moment is because the both parameters and results are being treated as empty because we're, we're not using the ones from the function type. So let's, I'm gonna have to look at the, how the abbreviation works because it really, the right thing to do here really depends on how you're allowed to abbreviate the function type. Um, so type use is a reference to a type definition. It may optionally be augmented by in explicit inline parameter and result declarations. That allows binding some dot symbolic identifiers to name the local indices. If inline declarations are given, then the types must match the referenced function type. So I think this side condition is going to make that a bit clearer. So here the side condition is just explaining how to produce the new context. So it's saying if 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 we if we don't have this abbreviation. Then Yeah, we just look up this index in the type defs and that gives us the function type. And yeah, I'm not this <laughs> There's a sort of a weird amount of informality in these formal specifications that make them really hard to understand. Like what does, firstly, I is just magically present. Like it's not part of the input to this relation. Like I is just some kind of ambient thing that's available. And here it's saying I prime is just the locals. But what about the, what about the parameters? The 
the use type index and the updated identifier context, including possible parameter identifiers. Um, actually, nothing about this is making sense to me, so that's not that's not very that's not a good sign, is it? Um, also, this side condition doesn't say anything about, oh no, it does, I'm sorry, T1 and T2 here are, show up inside what happens when you look up the type def. So I think this is saying that if you want to have anything at all here, it has to exactly match the types that are inside the type definition. The only difference being that these things can have IDs inside them. Right, okay. Um, sorry, this is a lot of talking and not very much making it work. I'm just, I'm just waiting for it to, for the dust to settle in my brain to figure out like what, what's supposed to happen here. I mean, essentially we need to do something different depending on whether these were provided or not. And I don't really know whether these were provided. Well, I mean, I guess if they're empty, then they weren't provided. You know, uh, so this is like if parameters results all empty, then like, well, I, I keep calling it an abbreviation, but it's not. This is like no inline uh, declarations, you know, else inline declarations. So I, I should just think about what I want to do in both of those cases. So if there are no inline declarations, then the local names should be, we don't have names for any of the parameters then. Well, if these are both empty, then I think we should just say, maybe this is it. Yeah, actually this is it. Because they have to match anyway, we can just say if they're empty, then parameters, well, then we can say function type. Populates. So maybe actually what I was doing before was fine. It's just that for our purposes, we don't need to look up the type def. I mean, you know, if we were trying to actually check that this program is syntactically valid, then we do need to look it up. But if they've provided, assuming all the way through this, I'm just assuming that, <laughs> I'm assuming that there's some validation pass that is gonna work magically. And I just haven't implemented that yet. So I'm not trying to do validation here. It's a whole separate part of the spec that I haven't even cracked open. I'm just thinking about structure, execution, and text format right now. And I'm gonna have to look at validation and binary format at some point, but I'm not worrying about that yet. So assuming a valid program, then either, yeah, this whole thing is assuming that you've provided a type index. So either you haven't provided any inline declarations, in which case we should use the ones from the type index, or you have provided some inline declarations, in which case we should use those ones. And because they have to match the arity that, that's in the, because validation will have confirmed that those inline declarations match the arity of the type def, we can just use them. And it's not going to be any worse than what was in the 
than what was in the type def. So I think probably what I had before was actually close to being right. It's just that we only do it in this case. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, give it a rest, Siri. I'm not sure I understand, to be honest. So actually, I think this local names business was a bit was a red herring. That was me just trying to think my way out of a paper bag unsuccessfully. So this should be. <laughs> so if type index isn't nil, so if we've been given a type index and also the inline parameters and results are all empty, then we should clobber them with whatever we find from the type definition. And it may be that the type definition is empty as well, but that's fine. So actually this parse locals can go back to where it was. Yeah, so this essentially, we're getting the parameters and results, then we're getting the locals, then we're constructing the local context using the parameters and locals, and I'm sort of worried that I can't see how that works here. And also, these seem to be in the wrong order. Why is it saying locals and then params? Oh... Oh, hold on, it's not. Right. I was just reading it wrong. I'm sorry. So this is the contribution to the environment, to the identifier context. This is the contribution of the function type. So this is nothing to do with the locals. This is just to do with what gets added to the identifier context as specifically what locals get added to the identifier context by the type of the function. And the answer is, well, we add all of the parameters, right? And if we've got names for those parameters because there was an inline declaration, then we use those names. And if there was no inline declaration, then we don't have names. So we just use, this is epsilon is like the empty string or whatever. It's like nil. So this is saying that we just, there are n parameters, and so we have n entries in locals that are all like nothing. So that does make sense. Um, actually, this id param function here is the thing that projects the identifier out of a parameter, but that is kind of what you would expect it to be. So I think that's... Oh, right, it's not an array, is it? <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, type defs, context.typedefs.inspect. index type index dot inspect <sighs> so this has succeeded a bunch of times but not here type desk index zero fine type desk index one not fine So again, let's let's do some more puts debugging and see what we're dealing with here. Okay, so this is all right. Look, 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 look. We're getting some information here. <laughs> all right, so back to the funk. So what's this? Large sig. Okay, so we're sort of situating ourselves here. Um. It looks like we survived all of the 
all of the earlier stuff. Like, it's actually getting a very long way in. But then it's down here. Void. F64. Oh, God. This is the kind of thing I was worried about. So, look. This... <laughs> God, this is horrible. This is really horrible. But they've done this intentionally. So the, the problem here is this. If you declare... So this must be in the definition of the initial... No, this is just an abbreviation, isn't it? A type use may be replaced entirely by inline parameter and result declarations. That's what's happening here. So there's no, here it's saying type zero, type one, or you've, you know, we've, we saw before it was like type dollar, whatever. This one isn't doing that. It's just saying function F takes an F64 and here's, oh, sorry, it returns an F64 and here is that, here's the body of that function. So this doesn't refer to any type def. But this is the thing that I was worried about earlier, is it says, if you if you don't have one of these type uses, you can just do inline parameter declarations, which is fine, and we support that. Like, the operational semantics are fine with that, and the parser knows how to parse it. But the thing we haven't done yet is this. It says, in that case, a type index is automatically inserted. So... So it's if you leave out the type use, it kind of generates one here with some value x. And it's like, well, what's x? And the answer is x is the smallest existing type index whose definition in the current module is the function type params onto results. So if this, if your function, so here the function is no input produces result f64 and so what this is saying is we got to look through the module and find the earliest type definition that has that type and then use the index of it in func so when we when we build the abstract syntax tree there should be an index in here that says ooh i'm referring to type index 5 and then we need to insert that, you know, here it says, if, if it, either we look it up and it says, if no such index exists, then a new type definition is inserted at the end of the module. So, oh God. So I think function definition Well, either it has to, either we have to build this functionality into the, I think this is what I'm going to do. Either we have to build this functionality into the initial context building so that when we're building the initial identifier context, we actually sort of simulate this and say like, well, every time we find a function definition, we actually check to see if it's using this abbreviated form, we check to see whether that can be turned into a reference to an existing type def. Oh, but... The problem is we can't even do it in order because it could be a forward reference. So maybe we need to do it when we're parsing the function, but then that means that parsing functions can modify the context. So parse function is gonna to have to return a new context so we first we we produce that initial context that's just using the top level identifiers of all the things and that's order doesn't matter there because we're not dereferencing anything we're just populating an identifier context so we don't have to worry about the fact that 
you know, one of those functions could re refer to the name of another one, because if it does, it's going to do it inside the body of that function. And we don't dereference that identifier until we try to parse the body of the function. We don't do that when we're building the identifier context. So we build the identifier context. It has almost all of the top level type definitions in it. But then when we actually descend into a function and start trying to parse it, we might exceptionally, so firstly, we have to do that in order. We have to run through the function definitions from top to bottom because what's happening here is that parsing this function definition actually generates a new type definition because we don't yet have this function type. But like, what's the index of that type definition? Well, it's not zero because there's already a type definition inside this module. So this needs to generate a function definition at index one and then refer to it. And then this one stays a zero. So that's what's going on here is that this one, this function here, i32 to void is referring to type zero, which is this one. You know, this is a function, it's the reason it's called that I can see is that this is a function that takes an i32, a 32 bit integer and returns nothing. Whereas this one takes nothing and returns a 64 bit float. And it's saying that that has to be a index one. And the only way that's gonna happen is that when we parse the body of this function, we synthesize a new type definition that comes after this one. And then we make this refer to it. So this function will have, when you look at the AST node, it will say it's using type one in just the same way as this one does. But this one, <laughs> the programmer here has anticipated what the index of the synthesized type definition is gonna be. <sighs> okay, so I think this is exactly why I was worried about doing local variables. But now that I've talked that out, I think that it's tractable. Um, so we have actually done this. We have actually done this. But what we've got to do now is... <laughs> Um, if a function definition contains no type use, is that the right? Yeah, a type use but it'll be replaced entirely. Yeah. If a function definition's type use has been replaced entirely by inline parameter and result declarations, automatically insert a type index referring to the smallest existing, well, referring to the first type, first matching type def in the module, or, well, you know, since well, let's say creating that type definition if necessary. Uh, okay. I mean, the thing is, I know this feels like I've been stuck on a failing test for ages, but actually what's happened here is that I am making incremental progress <laughs> because I'm, I've got all the way down to, you know, previously the parser was choking right at the top of this file because it couldn't deal with these references to the type definitions, but it does, on this evidence, it does appear to be successfully dereferencing all of those. You know, like here, for example, it successfully looked up this type reference, this type definition. So, I mean, it's almost tempting to ask is this the only place? Because yeah, expansion of inline function types is being tested specifically by this. I was wondering if I just, uh, see there are other places that should be assigned type sig. Um, I 
I was going to try commenting that one test out and see whether the rest of it passes, but just just by scrolling down, I can see that at the very least there are, well, maybe this doesn't matter so much, maybe this would be fine, because at the moment we're just sort of ignoring... You know, it, the problem we've got at the moment can only be detected by trying to refer to a type, a non-existent type definition with a numeric index, because we're not automatically inserting them at the moment. And I can't see any code here that's doing that. But then again, I haven't tried running this. Oh no, look, the, expl the implicit index three in this test depends on the function and type definitions. Okay, right, so this is testing the same kind of, the same kind of thing. Okay, all right, well, I will stop being lazy then and just try and implement it. So, yeah, I'm just really conscious that my diff is getting really big and I'm, I'm sort of all the way off in, all the way off into the weeds and I haven't actually committed anything yet. Um, well, that's fine. I'm just going to live with it. I could, I could, I was just thinking I could make a branch and start like dropping some of this stuff onto a branch. Um, but I think I'm almost there now. If I thought that half an hour ago, it would have been quite a smart thing for me to have done to start dropping these onto a branch. And then once I've made all the commits and everything's working, then I can figure out what's the order that I could land them in that would that would not break the tests. Or indeed, can they be landed separately or does it just have to be one big commit? But I've sort of missed my opportunity to think about that. Um, all right. So... Let me just comment out my debug code. So actually, we always have to have a type index. That's what this comes down to. If type index is nil, then uh, automatically yeah, that's a good point, Owen. Yeah, Owen says you could tactically stage some chunks with minus p. Yeah, I could I could start doing that. The the thing I'm avoiding thinking about is is there a way of because I sort of broke the test right at the beginning, right? Like since I first started making these changes, I've had test failures in the test suite, and I don't want to make a commit where the tests aren't all passing. So the thing that I'm not avoiding, but deferring thinking about is, are there pieces of this that I can land that aren't going to break the tests that, and don't require other bits? <laughs> and I'm actually not sure that there are. It's sort of, this is starting to feel like it's actually going to have to be a sort of an atomic change. Because as soon as I, well, no, that's not true. Because as long as I don't try to look stuff up in the context, then it's fine. Like, it's actually all of the... It's just the fact that I'm trying to dereference locals in the, in the identifier context that's causing this problem in the first place. So, actually, you've, you've provoked me into thinking about this properly. Um... Oh no no you know you've I've I've unprovoked myself. I'm going to try and concentrate on what I'm doing, and then there's going to be a separate, a whole different mental mode I'm going to go into. That's like, how do I now unpick this? Because <laughs> um, like I said, if I'd if I'd started out making incremental changes that weren't breaking the test, I would have just dropped the commits in. But as it is, I've I broke everything as the first thing I did. Um, but actually, yeah, I can see that some of these changes, in fact, a lot of these changes are going to be addable as long as the final thing I do is 
start dereferencing locals using the using the identifier context because until that moment nothing's actually broken because it doesn't really matter how whether the contents of the identifier context is correct or not because if no one's looking at it it's, it doesn't matter um anyway what am i talking about okay what i'm talking about is if the type index is nil then actually we need one <laughs> So that's where all of the magic happens. And then if it's nil, we have to do this business. And that's, I think we're back to this kind of. Right, so that's like, if there's no inline definitions, then we're just gonna use the ones from the type index. Um, I think that's okay. Uh, no, I can't be bothered. Um, okay, so what we have to do is try to find have to try and find a type try to find a func type that matches what we've got here in parameters and results um, which is going to be painful because we have to compare them oh crap crap so in order to answer this question we need the type information and I haven't put that in the AST at the moment, parameters have, and results, I think. Oh, results don't even have an AST node. <laughs> okay, okay, right, right. Or many, a whole flock of chickens are coming home to roost at this point because I haven't thought about this at all. I need to, okay, all right. Store type information on parameter, parameter, and <laughs> create a result and store type information on it. Okay, I mean at the moment I'm just using strings as uh, as results, which I could, which is I think the type, but like that's no good. Okay, all right, stash time. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to be able to make some progress here. Um, well, why don't I just, instead of stashing it all, why don't I just do what I said I was going to do? Um, which is the dangerous part is that last part. So let's git restore staged patch that bit and then git stash keep index uh, I think there's still going to be broken tests there yeah for the same reason um, but that's because I'm trying to do stuff. Like if I stop doing that, there we go. So the tests are fine at the moment because I'm not trying to do anything. <laughs> um, leave that in tab three because that's what I've generally been doing um, okay so let's try and work off some of this git debt and then I'll do these things and then I'll actually do the thing that I'm trying to do um, that 
fix me is that's the last thing I can think about at the moment. Um, okay, so I mean, in actual time, the first thing I did here was add locals, right? Yeah, I really shouldn't have. I really shouldn't have let it go this far. Um, I'm normally better about this sort of thing, but I think I got a bit distracted thinking about the problem and forgot to, you know, be in any way disciplined. Um, so hold on, what's this? That just adds locals to the context. We're not actually using it for anything yet. Oh, I'm actually I'm actually adding stuff to the context down there. Right. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. This is good. All right. So this is like add. So this is all fine. This is just like add locals. Uh, I'm just trying to remember what I did. Did I say index space? Yeah. Add locals index space to identify a context. Okay. Um, So what, so what, <laughs> um, so yeah, ignoring all of the type def stuff, I think I can add just that bit, can't I? Ignore that parse type here stuff. And just do this bit. So, So I think that's I think that's quite wholesome actually. So this is um, add parameter and local names to identify a context when parsing function. Okay, that is also fine. Um, So now I need to think about well, I suppose introducing types and type tests. So this adds them to the context. Uh, I know I'm going to have to do this at some point, but not until I actually put anything into it. So I think that kind of comes in with this, comes in with this change.
So again, I, I can't see any reason why that would have broken anything. Add types, index space, and type defs to identify a context. So let's say um, type defs isn't actually an index space. It just carries the type definitions, which correspond to the type names, to the type identifiers in the types index space. And then I guess I'm gonna maybe add this one. Because that sort of directly relates to that. <laughs> that commit message I just wrote. Um, so this is gonna say like skip um, empty, oh, skip well formedness check for uh, type defs. Identify a context well formedness check. Uh, and I think there was a reference that I could have used there. Um, yes. The, doc the spec says that an identifier context is well formed if no index space contains duplicate identifiers, but type defs is not an index space. So we shouldn't try to enforce well-formedness, well, uh, uniqueness on its, on its contents when composing identifier contexts. Okay, test is still green, that's good. Um, just comments. Um, here I'm gonna just rename type index to index because that was one of the changes I'd made and it's sort of interfering with my comprehension of the other change I've made. So let's say rename type index local to just index in parse type use. Um, th the kind of index, well, now that this code has been extracted into a small method, the kind of index is obvious from context. Okay. So, So we pass the context in. Okay, so we have to populate it first. Uh, build initial context in AST parser.rb. Have I already done something? Add function names to initial identifier context. So this is something like uh, add what's it say? 
add function names to initial identifier context. So this is going to be like add types and type definitions. Well, maybe it's just like add type definitions to initial identifier context. Um, and then I can just say uh, the names and the function types themselves are stored separately. Well, let's see. The spec says that the names and the function types themselves are stored separately in the identifier context. So I'm doing that too. Um, uh, because I need all the help I can get at this point. <laughs> I mean, it's not necessary, but it, it means that I can refer to the spec rather than try and remember how I've chosen to do it. Um, okay. So now what? Now I suppose it's like using that. Now is this going to be problematic? I think it's going to be okay because it's only going to try to do anything when it's got an index. And so I think we should have entries for all of those things. I'm not sure, but I hope that this isn't doing anything beyond what... I don't know what I'm talking about. I've got no idea whether these tests are going to pass. I think they should, but, I mean, obviously you can't... <sighs> because of Rice's theorem... You've just got to run a program and see what it does. Don't try and think about it. I think that's the essential content of that theorem. All right, good. Sometimes you get lucky when you think about computers. Um, so this is... Um, Well, essentially, it's like look up type indexes in identifier context in parse type use. Look up type index in identifier context. Look up the type index in the identifier context in parse type use. Is that what this is doing? I think the answer is yes. I think it is doing that. <laughs> okay, cool. Now, was that already... Well, I suppose the question is, does the interpreter even care about that? And I think the answer to that might be no. Although, actually... I think maybe it does. Let's have a look. Because if it does, that's quite a nice... So what's that going to affect? Um... Uh... I don't know. Ah, uh, yes, here we go. Get parameter names. I was I was expecting it to be inside invoke function, but actually this has been extracted. So here's the, we were switching on the type index. If If I've now got rid of all of them, then I should just be able to do this. 
if I've got rid of all the strings, sorry, then I should just be able to do types.slice function.typeindex because there should be no more strings. Oh yeah, this is so that it can, yeah, okay. Yeah, the whole premise of getting the parameter names is something that's gonna go away once we get this work, once we get all this working um, because param because references to parameters won't use their names anymore. Um, but if this works, it'll be rather nice because that, that's I've actually made some progress. Yes, oh, and this is, um, I mean, it's starting to make me question uh, many things about, you know, the world and also my life choices. Um, okay, well, that's, that's good because I've actually made concrete progress there. And in fact, I could have made all that progress without adding locals to the identifier context. So that's sort of it, it's a, it's all a bit in the wrong order now. Um, but that's okay. Let's just let's just plow on. So this is Yeah, so for some of these it's like We kind of made the... Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Uh, maybe these, maybe these always are IDs, actually, because I, let me just, let me just double check this, because I've got to fix me there, but maybe it's, um, maybe that is wrong. Element list. I don't even know what I'm looking at. What am I doing? It's the ones that appear inside tables, right? Table elements. An element segment can be given in line with a table definition. Its offset is zero. The limits of the table type, blah, blah, blah. Table ID, LM, vector of element expressions. Yeah, like these can be, these can be numeric function indexes. So I'm I'm right to be suspicious. Um, anyway, I think this is a slightly different situation because I didn't have to make this change, but now I'm able to make it. So let's say. Uh, Um, stop finding, what is it? Stop finding type definitions by name in the interpreter. Um, the parser is now de referencing all of these, uh, Is now using the identifier context to dereference all of these. Well, let's say that's not very clear, is it? Um, convert all of these names into numeric indexes, so we don't. So we can just. So we can always. Uh, use types.slice to pull out the type at the appropriate 
index. Okay. Uh, so this was the thing we did before. I should have used restore theirs, but I accidentally typed the wrong thing as so often happens. So now we're sort of back to where we were. Um, so I'm assuming in my diff I've got the... Oh, have I somehow lost the local variable lookup? Yes. So I think this is where I wanted to get to is like wind, yeah, wind us all the way back to when I went off on one. So Okay, just taking a breath and thinking about what I want, how I want to approach this. So this is my goal. I want to be able to do this. But at the moment, it's not this that's causing the problem, I don't think. Like, if I just comment out that, that part of it, the problem is coming from finding the right type def. So we're not even ready to start using that locals index space yet. Oh, let me just try running funk. Yeah. And I think if I, you know, if I, if I reveal some of this, we'll see it getting all the way down to that. Yeah, that void F64, right. So yeah, I, I, the current, the sort of the, the distal goal is to be able to use the locals context, but the proximate goal is to be able to use the type defs um, and in order to do that, I have to, right, okay, I'm glad I wrote this down, right, so I've got, <laughs> okay, because, because what I need to do, so let's just say, to do, try to find an existing type def that matches parameters and results. If that type def exists, use its type index. If that type def does not exist, add it to the identifier context. And that's the that's the really scary part. Well, I suppose it's not that scary. We just have to return parse function is going to have to return an identifier context in addition to the AST node, but that's that's because parsing a function can modify the identifier context. And actually, as I talked about before, um, I'm going to at some point make it so that all parsing all of these things returns an identifier context and a proc representing the unfinished computation to create the AST node. And then, so we do a single pass over the whole S expression. 
we get back a final identifier context for the module and also a proc which will generate the AST for that module. And then we just pass that identifier context into the proc that sort of forces the thunks all the way down and then sort of threads the identifier context down through the, through the whole tree of procs. And then we get an AST node back at the end. So that's where I'm going to go eventually. And that's going to entail all of these functions, all of these methods returning an identifier context. But parse function is going to get there a little bit earlier because, yeah, I just can't see a way to make this work in that pre-processing phase. It has to be done here because of, Yes, because of forward references. Because we need to be able to check type defs that don't exist yet. So G here needs to be able to use T even though T comes after G. <laughs> So we have to, as long as we're doing it in two passes, we have to do the first pass to collect the fact that T is an explicit type definition. And then on our second pass, we can, when we encounter this, we can then, or indeed this, we can look at the explicit type definitions and see whether there's one that matches, which in this case it does, in this case it doesn't. And then that means we have to synthesize another one. So, um... Yeah, I was just trying to break this down a bit. Try to find an existing type def that matches parameters and results. If that type test exists, use its type index. If that type test does not exist, add it to the identifier context and use the resulting type index. Okay. Well, that's easy. So we're just trying to do the first part of this. Try to find an existing type def that matches results, that matches parameters and results. Now the problem is we don't have any type information for parameters. So let's go to the AST. Um, let's say that a parameter, let's just see what, again, I'm not beholden to this, but let's just see what parameters look like. Um, I suppose it's types I need to look at. So we've got a function type. What's the result type? A vector of value types. I mean, I guess that actually, certainly parameter and result don't have an, don't have an import. There's not an important difference between them. Like syntactically, they say param and result to tell you about whether it's talking about an input or an output to the function. But actually, by the time it turns into abstract syntax, we sort of should have lost that. It doesn't really matter. Or rather, we just need to separately store the parameter types and the result types. So that's what this is suggesting, is that you have a sort of a type constructor, and then the res each of what's on each side of this is just a vector of or what this calls val types. So you can't have... It looks like you can't have higher order functions. You can only have a function that takes, is that right? Yeah, okay, so you can have a reference to another function, but you can't have, arbit you, can't, you can't have a tree of function type constructors to make a sort of a higher order function here. It can only be input to output and one of the inputs or outputs could be a function reference type, whether that is, we haven't got to that yet, but you can't have arbitrarily nested uh, function type constructors. So I think that's that's something to put on the to-do list somewhere. God, I remember when I was doing this. Yeah, I've sort of, I'm nearly ready to do this. When re when deciding the return type of a function, use the type definition referred to by the type use, if there is one. Like there definitely will be by the time I'm done with this. Um, let's just stick this on the general to-dos. So I'll say, um, uh, 
remove remove the distinction between parameter and result and local in the AST since these are just packaging up a, a result type for a particular purpose, i.e. input to or output from a function. They don't need to be distinguished in the AST beyond where they appear, i.e. on the left or right side of the function type. So it's not really a problem at the moment, but that's this is one more sort of wrinkle for me to iron out when I when I've got all this working. Um, but for now, I'm just going to continue and say like, well, parameters. I'm, I'm worrying about does it go before or after the name? The name's going to the name of the parameter is going to go away quite soon because once we've got the locals um, working. Yeah, but this creates this creates a problem of how the name and type are going to be conveyed between methods. But that's that's a problem for another time. So okay, the change I'm doing right now is adding types to parameters. Uh, I think that this on its own will break the tests because all the places where we make a parameter are now going to be wanting for a type. Right. So here's where we read the type, but we just ignored it. Uh, and here, I'm actually going to name this one because the use of it is all the way over here. And I can use punning. So for this one, every single this is for the abbreviation where it just says bra open brackets param u32 u32 f64 whatever um, so that's just going to store all the types so i think yes so let me um I want that, not that, not that. Yes. No, that's where the problem is. No, no. So hopefully this is all fine. So this is like add type information to parameter AST nodes. Um, we need this to find a matching type definition if no uh, type index is given in a function definition. find or create there we go so that's all okay um, in parse result yeah this is naughty isn't it because it should be basically the same like when I, I was talking before about how I haven't come I haven't refactored these to sort of factor out the common code but I mean in practice I think these are all just gonna become the same thing I mean I guess they need to be able to well they actually don't need to assert what the what the atom they're reading first is um, it could be that this is a method that you just the caller knows what it's gonna do you know if this was just result type dot new 
the caller knows whether it's whether that result type corresponds to a parameter or a function result or a local variable. So I think these three things are just going to become the same, the same function ultimately. Um, although these should probably become the same function uh, after the above task is done. And what I'm going to do is move this because it's relevant. So, okay. Good. Um, right. So the point is we basically want exactly the same thing here because this is just, this is just throwing away all of the S expression inside it. Um, but we don't want that. What we want is for it to say result dot new. Can a re I don't think a result can have a name though. So this actually is different. Having said all that, uh, although, you know, the names are optional for the other one, so I think I can just reuse the same code. Uh, functions, type use. Oh, of course, it's just a reference to a type def, isn't it? Uh, result. Yeah, so the result doesn't have an ID, so we don't do this bit. So actually, yeah, maybe the repeatedly read was kind of, did kind of make sense. So AST result equals data define type. I'm sort of overloading the use of the word type here. This is just going to be a string. It's going to be one of, well, let's see this val type. It's going to be, you know, one of these strings, essentially. Um, so I need to think about if and how I'm going to actually represent that. But for now, a string is fine. Um, So is that okay? Yeah, it sort of feels like it should be okay. So let's say These commit messages aren't particularly edifying. Um, let's just say add result AST node um, and create it in AST parser. This only holds the type of the function result. Uh, but it's less confusing <laughs> to have an AST node for this in the, because that's what we do with the functions parameters. Sort of be explicit about the fact that we can have multiple of each of those. Okay, so store type information on parameter, create a result and store type information in it. Now it's basically time for us to make this work. Um, Uh, 
Okay. <sighs> okay, try to find an existing type def that matches parameters and results. So the type defs are context.type defs. Is there, does enumerable have like find index or somewhere? Returns the index of a specified element. Our oh, array has this, right. Returns the index of the first element for which the block returns a truthy value, right. Oh, and it is on enumerable, okay. Okay. Well, I think I'll use I think I'll use find index then because that feels a bit more it's assuming less about the thing I'm calling it on so so let's say type index equals and so we're going to try to type def uh, okay, what are we going to say? So at the moment, the type def is just a hash, isn't it? Um, so this condition is going to be type def Uh, fetch parameters. Problem is I can't just I can't just say equals parameters because the inline ones can have names. So really, what I need to do is just compare types. And the results equals the results map type. So I think that is the try to find an existing type def that matches parameters and results. I'm not expecting that to actually help with this because this depends upon our synthesizing one. Um, although it should help for this, this reuses explicit type definition, but we just haven't got there yet. Uh, although actually we get down to here. So let's see if this says um, found, well, let's see, <laughs> found, Uh, type def with index, type index, inspect, for parameters, parameters.inspect, results, results.inspect. So I'm actually hoping that when we hit, that the, this one is going to say nil, because it's just not going to find one, and that's what we need to deal with next. But I'm hoping that G is going to find this type def here with index zero. Ugh. Found, t oh yeah, here we go. Found type def with index zero for parameters I32. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, at least that works. 
Um, I was, you know, I was groaning because a lot of them are saying nil here. But that's okay because we're going to synthesize them. So is there something I could commit here? I think there is actually because Yes, I have to be careful. Because <sighs> I can't do the else if yet. Let me just leave the leave the leave the debug code in for now so that I can just run it and see it work right so all of these nils are fine because we don't try to do anything with it um, but all of these ones where there was an existing type def, it's hooked it up just fine. So that's great. Because that's something I can commit. So, um... What did I say here? Oh, uh, I deleted it. Um, automatically insert a type index referring to the first matching type definition. Um, this can st can still be nil at the moment if there is no such matching definition, but that doesn't cause any problems yet because we're not trying to <laughs> use that type index to look up the appropriate type definition in the identifier context. Before we can start doing that, we need to automatically insert missing type definitions where necessary. And I'm going to implement that next. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, well, look. Tick. <laughs> um, this is a separate job. Create that type def if necessary. So here we go. If that type def exists, use its type index. That is what we are doing. If that type deck theft does not exist, add it to the identifier context and use it. So this is like, if type index is nil, then try to find it. Um, if type index is still nil, <laughs> then yes, well, we're not really in a situation to do this, are we? Uh, okay, let's stash this. So before I can think about doing that, I need 
the concept of adding stuff to the identifier context. So let's make the return value of this, the AST node, and also the context, which at the moment is just the context that it received. And then all of the callers of parse function, which fortunately is just this one, have to deal with the fact that this now returns a pair. So parse function context into function context. And then we just add the function onto the end. So yeah, and the function, the context is local to this module. So I was worried abstractly, I was worried that this was gonna be a this is gonna become a recursive yak shave where it's like well okay now and now I'm gonna have to return that modified context to my caller and so on but actually no one cares about the context outside of this because it's it's been constructed specifically for this set of fields and it's only used when we parse this set of fields so that's fine I suppose parse type doesn't need to know about the identifier context. I'm just suspicious that we don't pass the context in. I mean, fundamentally, all of this, all of these nodes which carry, the fact that I'm using AST nodes to carry the result of these functions is actually a bit wrong. Because we don't need the names in the AST nodes, but at the moment, the name is being conveyed you know, I'm sure in def build, uh, I'm using. Oh yeah, this doesn't call parse type. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, oh, sorry, I'm getting distracted. But that's something that's something that I can clean up actually. Um, but keep my eyes on the prize. What was I doing? Right. So well, let's run the tests. But I think this is something like, um, allow parse function to return a potentially updated identifier context. And then this is gonna say, at the moment it's just the same one, but we're going to need to extend it with new type definitions as we parse functions, uh, as we discover inline function types with no corresponding type definition. So we need it to be wired up to the parse text fields method. Okay. Uh, to make that possible, updating the context let's say, extending the context possible. Oh, let's call it updating. Updating it to an extended one. Okay, the tests are all happy. Okay, we're getting dangerously close. I didn't I don't have something to tick there because unfortunately this is that was a subtask of creating that type def if necessary, but now we are perilously close to being able to do it. If that type def does not exist, add it to the identifier context and use the resulting type index. So 
I mean, the type index at the end of this is going to be context.typedefs.length. So I might as well set that now because once we once we update the context, that is going to give a different value. So let's just let's preset the type index. So what that means is if there were well, maybe the easiest way to think about it is if there were zero type definitions, then after we've added this one, it's going to be at index zero. Um, and likewise, if there were five, then that means that the, the currently last one is at index four, and then this one's going to be at index five. So just asking for the length gives us the length is always the next index is what I'm trying to say. I hope you enjoyed that explanation of how successes and zero-based indexing and fence post errors work. Um, we're always learning something on this stream. Uh, right, so that tells me where it's going to be. Now, what is it going to be? I'm just going to see. <laughs> I sort of don't know off the top of my head what goes in. Oh, of course I do. It's just a little hash. Right, I don't have a representation of this. And sort of rightly so, because, well, is it right? Maybe not. Maybe it... I don't know why I'm saying rightly so. I probably should have an AST node for this. Um, have an AST node for type defs or function types or whatever. <laughs> like, it is essentially the same. Uh, it's essentially the same concept you know the thing that's inside a type def is like a function type basically um, so it needs parameters and results the names don't matter but it's okay if they have names because that's just like documentation or whatever so I think I can literally just say context dot type defs. Oh, hold on. No, I can't do that. I was gonna like modify it, and actually I could do that, but that's not the, that's not what I want to do. At least it's not what I was planning to do. I was gonna say context. Well, here I'm using locals context. So let's say type defs context equals context dot new type defs <laughs> parameters results and that whole thing needs to be oops sorry apologizing to vim how pathetic is that okay so we make a context so hold on we've made this context that's got a new type def in it and now we have to actually update the context And then this carries through to when we parse the body and it will be temporarily extended with the locals, but that doesn't get returned out the bottom here. Okay, I think that's right. Ooh, it got a lot further. Look, we got through all of that stuff. So this is like adding 
type defs context dot inspect to identifier context. So we can see Where's that void stuff? So here we go. F found type def of index nil. Well, that's a lie. Yeah, you didn't find one. Adding uh, parameters, so void and result F64 to the identifier context. Then G finds type def with index zero. Apparently, both of these managed to, well, are we, we're not looking it up yet, are we? Oh, we are looking it up. Right, but that's in the diff. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's try and be incremental about this. So this is what's new. And then this is the th this is the problematic bit. Oh, what? What? What the hell? Unhandled exception in get parameter names. Oh. Owen says maybe something where mixing unnamed type defs with the locals is flowing through. <sighs> I don't think that's it. I think what's happening here is that What even is this? Types. So there's a more serious problem here, which is that part of what's needed here is to add functions, sorry, is to add type definitions to the identifier context so that they can be looked up successfully while we're dereferencing all the identifiers. But also, I mean, this types here is like, this is something that the, that the does the interpreter still need this? Yeah, it does, because the interpreter needs to know the arity of the function, right? So it's important that the it's important that the that the AST contains information about the types of everything. Because it's not just used, it's not just you can't erase all the types and then the program's still valid because the semantics of well, the
the way that function calls work, the operations that you do on the stack depend on the arity of the function. How many arguments does it take? How many values does it return? And you need to know that. So it has to be written out in the AST in the form of a type definition. So the problem I've got here is that types here is actually type definitions, I think. Um, so when we read a module, we just get this big blob of type definitions. Um, uh, yeah, so this these have come from the type definitions. So unfortunately, it's not enough to add it to the, it's not enough to just add, it's not enough to just update the context. We also need to add another type definition here. But it's got to go at the end. So we're going to need. Okay, all right. All right. This is this is a living nightmare. Um, so what we need to do here is when we parse a function, we not only get an updated identifier context. Yeah, that's right, Owen, pushing the new type defs all the way back up to the module. So there's sort of two things that need to happen. One of them is that we need to extend the identifier context to have that type definition in it. But we also need the module to have that type definition in it because the, the identifier context is used for the remainder of the parsing that we're doing. So we need for the while we're part so you you know the error we got here was not in the parser it was in the interpreter so the parser finished successfully because adding the type definitions to the identifier context is sufficient um well although i mean all i was doing was adding them um but that doesn't do any harm it's just now the index that we've just generated in the AST is now referring to a type definition that doesn't exist in the AST. So it's, it exists in the identifier context, which is fine for the duration of the parsing, but by the time it gets to the interpreter, we've generated an index to a non-existent type definition. So what I'm going to need to do here <laughs> is also get some... Um, get some, well, can there ever be more than one? Like this might generate a new type definition basically, but I think it can only ever generate one. I'm gonna call it type def. <laughs> um, all of these names need some serious thought. So parsing a function can also return a type definition. It won't have a name. And what I need to do here is say like, um, something like, You know, we need like, what is it? You know, we'll call it like generated types or something. I can't even add it to the types at this point because it has to go at the end. So we, after the function definition, there might be some more type definitions. And so we can't just push this onto types because it would be in the wrong position. It has to come after all of the types, all of the explicit ones. Um, inline for implicit type definition. Uh, what a pain this is. Um, so it's inserted. 
Yeah, and then it says abbreviations are expanded in the order they appear such that previously inserted type definitions are reused by consecutive expansions. So we've already achieved that by extending the context, but we just have to preserve this information beyond parsing so that the interpreter knows about it. So it needs to be in the AST as well. So let's call this inserted types because just because that's the verb that this uses, it says um, inserted. A new type definition of the form blah is inserted at the end of the module. Is that what I want to call it? No, that's silly. I'll call it generated. Generated types. So that starts off as an empty array. So we add the function to the functions list and then we say Okay, I'll just call it type because that's what it wants to be called because all of this is called type and that's the wrong name for it but at least locally to this function you can see that this is the same kind of thing as this even though both of them are called the wrong thing. Um, although, you know, that's what the <laughs> this calls them type so that's why I called it type is because that's what... So maybe that's fine. Anyway, the concept of type is somewhat over loaded in this specification um okay so we add it to the generated types and then down here the types is not just the ones that we that we actually parsed but also the ones that we generated so they all come after yeah i think that's right oh in saying Vaguely wondering how this might work differently if there were an AST node for type def. Well, I mean, there is. Uh, it's just that it's called type. <laughs> so because, because that's what they called it here. Although actually, I mean, yeah, look, this is what I've got. I've got an AST node called type. Um, but now that I look at this, the, the meaning of this thing here like this is showing you what the synthesized attribute is for this piece of syntax and it's saying when which essentially means this is this double arrow is sort of like the parsing function essentially in this specification so it's saying when you see an s expression that looks like this open bracket the atom type an optional id and then a function type it's saying that this essentially parses into ft which is the function type well it's the synthesized attribute for the function type so if we if we then recursively parse this function type, that is what the return value should be. So effectively what this is saying, and we don't have to, you know, I can implement this however I want, but the way that the formal specification is going is that it says when you find a type definition like this, like the, the production in the grammar is called type, but whatever, when you find this type, de uh, type definition like this, in the AST it should just be represented by the whatever parsing the func type gives you and parsing the func type just gives you this function type right a, a, a vector of inputs arrow a vector of outputs so really if i was gonna think about what the ast node should be here i don't think i should even have a type definition ast node in the first place like that's sort of a bit of a category error i should really just have this uh function type um yeah, and that's sort of what this is. Have an AST node for type defs or function types or whatever. It's essentially the same concept. I mean, I think I'm going to refine this to say, because I already, you know, I'm saying to you, I've already got an AST node for type definitions. I've got a to-do telling me to have an AST node for type definitions, so my bad. This should say, have an AST node for function types and use this instead of the type AST node. Uh, because the spec says that parsing a type definition produces a function type. Um, we'll need to find a better way of conveying the name of that type definition alongside the function type when returning both from parse type. So that's the only, that's really the only job that this AST node is doing here is it's like packaging up both the name and the function type into a single object. But 
it's doing double duty in, a, in an unsatisfying way. So really this whole method should be returning some other data structure. Maybe it's just a hash. Um, and then the actual node that goes into the AST should just be these two things packaged up into a function type and this name should have evaporated. But the reason why the name is still in here is because we still need it in the interpreter because I haven't because I've still got index because I've, I've I haven't got indexes for the types yet. So I'm this is all gonna some of this is gonna come out in the wash. As soon as I remove name from the type AST node, then that's gonna create a problem inside parse type because I think someone somewhere cares about those names. Um it's presumably in build initial content. No, I've, I've already I'm stuck in a my brain is stuck in a loop. Build initial context deliberately doesn't use those helpers. So it doesn't care what parse type returns. It deconstructs the syntax itself to read out the name. So actually it's going to be fine. I've just got to remove that from the AST node and then I can just rename that AST node to function type and it'll be fine. Um, it is unwinding. Uh, unfortunately, I am also unwinding, so it's a bit of a race against time to see who unwinds first. Um, okay, right. So this is... Oh, well, this is all science fiction because parse function doesn't return a generated type. So... So just for now, I'm going to shim this by saying generated type equals nil, just so that I can wire this up correctly. And then when we apply this patch, we apply the stash back on, um, I'm going to actually assign generated type to a type that's got the parameters and results in it and I'm going to have to give it a dummy name because that name is still hanging around like a bad smell on the on the type AST node even though it's we're trying to get rid of it um oh uh hold on oh maybe I did did I check that it was nil no but I do need to check that uh unless type nil because I don't, I don't want to stick nils into that generated types. Um, okay. Okay. So what is this? Oh, <laughs> so the, the last time I actually successfully made a commit was allow parse function to return a potentially updated identifier context. I'm going to say allow parse function to return an optional generated type definition. <laughs> um, at the moment, it's always nil. But if we need to generate a new type definition, uh, I mean, this is, okay, I'm just going to finish typing this and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to have a moan. We need to generate, but if we need to generate a new type de definition for uh, the function's type index to refer to, we'll need to add that type definition to the AST so that the interpreter can find it at runtime. What I was going to say was, well, no, maybe this is, maybe I'm going too far. What I was going to say was, I've been a bit, I, I've sort of charged into this, just doing what the spec 
is asking for. So the spec's got all of this weird stuff about synthesizing these type definitions and so on. Um, and what I was going to say was, I don't have to do it this way. Like, I, yeah, I mean, I guess the reality is I don't even need to do any of this identifier context stuff if I don't want to. I could just allow symbolic names to be present in the interpreter like they are right now and it works fine. Um, but even if I wanted to get rid of the symbolic names, what I was going to say was that I, I don't need to follow all of this these weird prescriptions about generating type definitions and stuff. But actually, I think I do. And in fact, I'm a little bit confused about how that funk.wast was actually working before. Like, because it's referring to Like, what? How was this ever working? Because this is referring to a... This is referring to the implicit type definition that is generated by this function definition. So how was this type index ever working? I don't understand why... I don't understand how I was able to run this code because this was the this was the realization that I had while I was gearing up to complain about it is that like you you can't ignore it because a a web assembly programmer can predict and refer to the index of a generated type definition in a function definition so you have to Either you have to do exactly what the spec says, which is basically what I'm doing, or you have to do something else that has exactly the same result as the spec has. And I'm just a little bit baffled. Oh, I know why. Or do I? I think I do know why. Which is that I, I haven't done this yet. When deciding the return type of a function, e.g. when unwinding the stack after return, use the type definition referred to by the type use. So I'm not doing that at the moment. So how do I decide the return type of a function? Oh, well, this function doesn't get called. So that would explain it. But also, I think maybe... Well, okay, I guess that does explain it. But also, I think maybe I'm using the assertion to decide how many return... I think at the moment, I might... I think I might use assert return to infer that this function returns one argument, which is not right. Like, you're supposed to use the type of the function to find out how many values it returns. So... It, even if this function isn't being called, um, if it was being called, I think it would work because I've got a hack at the moment that is like naughtily inferring the return arity of the function from the nature of this assertion. But I should be using this one to look up type definition one and looking at the result f64 here and realize that there's a it returns a single value but it just so happens that i haven't been bitten by that yet but it's amazing that this whole file doesn't have uh, i guess they've got no way of testing it because the only way to make an assert return that passes is that you have to assert that it returns the right number of things. And as soon as you tell my interpreter what the right number of things is, it can hook into that and ignore the ignore the, the type definition. So maybe that's not something that it's possible to write a to write a test to to detect. Um, what was I doing? Okay. <laughs> I feel like my brain's all over the place at the moment because I'm just like, I'm so many levels down the, you know, I was just trying to tick one item here that was look up local variables in an identifier context and it's generated so many 
brain meltingly difficult <laughs> tasks. I mean, none of them is that difficult, but it's just at a high level, it's hard for me to integrate all of these pieces in my brain. Like every single one of them is quite simple, but just like keeping all the Lego blocks stuck together without it just sort of disintegrating into a pile is actually, um, is, is proving slightly difficult. Okay, so now parse function is able to return an optional generated type definition. Uh, how bad are those merge conflicts? Yeah, that's very true. I and mean, the act of discovery does take work and space in the brain. <laughs> I think my brain is uh, my brain is running short on well the capacity for work and the space at the moment. Okay, well that merge conflict is not very bad. Um, in fact, I just want to move generated type inside this. Uh, Okie doke. So this, I believe, is just going to be type dot new because right now that's what go. This is what has to go in the AST, right? Its name is nil. Its parameters are. Is it okay for me to just share? A reference to these yeah this whole thing is immutable so it is you know I was just I just had a brief moment of like is it okay for this type definition to literally hold on to the same object reference as has just been created by parsing the type use but I can't see any reason why that would be a problem because this is all immutable it's totally fine to do structural sharing it's not gonna no one's going to reach in and mutate something and then it has sort of spooky action at a distance. So I think that's fine. I don't need to copy them or anything. And they'll come along with the par if the parameters have got names, then they'll just be part of that generated type. And if they don't, then they won't. And that's fine too, because they don't have any effect. Um, all right. Well, I assume I was expecting this test to pass at this point. Well, this isn't even... This is just trying to add stuff. It's it's not even using it yet. Okay, good. So what is this? Uh, insert. Let's see insert a generated type definition if no matching one can be found uh, let's say we have to add this to the identifier context so that the parser knows about it <laughs> and to the AST so that the interpreter knows about it. Okay, so Tests are all passing. More merge conflicts. <laughs> uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, well, that's rather easy to resolve. Um, this is a little harder to resolve, but that's the only one. Okay. So actually this was just some some debug puts in. Oh, and of course this. So that's the really critical bit. 
are we actually ready to do this? I mean, this isn't even what I was trying to do, but this is this is as close to home as we've been on this whole journey is every time we find a type index and there's no inline parameters or results, then just look up the type definition in the identifier context. And actually, I think I could have done this sooner if it wasn't for the interpreter. Like, I think the parser would have been happy with this, but because there wasn't an AST node for the type definition, it was, um, even though the parser would have been, would have quite happily looked up the type def in the identifier context, it would, the index that it was using to do that would not be valid from the, uh, from the interpreter's perspective. <sighs> okay, funk. <sighs> Great. Okay, so, like, nothing very good has happened yet, but I finally plugged in all of the machinery that I need. So I've got, or create that type def if necessary. That is now working. And we are now looking up. I didn't have a to-do for this, but we're looking up the, we're looking up the type def. So, thank you, Owen, for the ta-da emoji. <laughs> I, I appreciate the celebratory sentiment. Um, so just that. I'm just going to turn this fix me into a flipping to do because I don't need that crapping up all of my git diffs for the rest of time. Um, so what's this saying? Leisurely parser refactoring. Uh, in parse elements, check whether the index is a string or an integer before trying to look it up in the functions index space of the identifier context. Okay. Okay, so where is that fix me? Let's just get rid of that. That's what I don't. I don't really want to keep all that stuff in in band. Um, I've got a couple of to dos in this file, but I've tried to keep it to a down to a dull raw. Okay, so this is I'm just like there's nothing else effectful in here, is it? It's just putzes and stuff. Nothing material. Okay. Um, so what is this? Um, if inline, if function has no inline type, look up uh, Hold on. Before I do this. So this is in an else at the moment. But the condition here was if type index is nil. And that is no longer true by the time we reach here. Like, we'll take a couple of attempts to make it not nil. But, like, this will always make it not nil because we're assigning it to the length of the type defs in the, in the identifier context. So, should this really be else if? I mean, it doesn't do anything useful if we've just... It doesn't do anything useful if we've just looked up, because this is all about, what this does is it gets the parameters and the results from the type def, whereas what this does 
is it finds or generates a type def from the parameters and results. So actually, I think this is okay. It wouldn't do any harm to make it like this and have it be independent, but that's maybe more confusing. I don't know. The point is it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, check this yeah if function has no inline type uh, get the parameter and result types from the uh, has no inline parameter and results get them from the type definition Yeah, I think that's fine. I think I could have I think I could have added this ages ago. I don't know why I didn't. Um So Owen's saying I was trying to think if it could be possible to come out of that first branch and still not know the types. I don't see how. Out of this this block here. Um no. Because if this second conditional, I mean, if, if what you mean is not know the type index, this thing here always sets the type index. So like we try to look it up and then if we can't, we just set it to be the next slot in the, in the identifier context in the type defs index space. And then we populate that next slot in the identifier context. So we're sort of, this here is inserting a new type in the identifier context for this index to refer to. So it's not by the time we reach this end, there has to be a there has to be a type index. Um, so yeah, it doesn't. It really it really doesn't. It's just a question of taste whether we break this off as a separate condition or really. But I think making it separate makes it looks like it's look like it's genuinely independent of this. Um, and I just don't think that it is. Um, so I think it's clearer to just leave it connected like that for now. I mean, this method is becoming suspiciously large. So I think this, this is going to need to be decomposed into some, like, this is not comprehensible. <laughs> so it needs to be broken down into some actually comprehensible pieces. And then maybe at that point, it becomes necessary for these two pieces to, be, to work independently. And that's absolutely fine. Um, but while they live right next to each other like that, I'll try and be as expressive as possible, which is to say, even though this condition becomes invalidated by this block, we still want to say, otherwise do this other thing, because this other thing has no effect if this, if we've just set the type index to refer to an, either an existing or a newly generated type definition that contains exactly the parameters and results that we were given in line, um, then this block is only going to do anything in the case where the I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> Nothing I was saying was interesting or useful. Okay. Okay. So now I'm racking my brain for reasons why I shouldn't just do the thing where the thing is this thing. Why shouldn't I do that now? Because this has all been about, this whole massive yak shave has been about populating this context correctly in a way that doesn't break the interpreter, right? So we've had to do this this was mainly what we needed was just looking up the right type definition. But then we also needed to do this synthesizing a new type definition so that when we did the lookup later, the indexes would always be in range. Um, but really all, all we've been trying to do is make it so that this locals context has got everything we need to be able to parse the body of the function and have all of the flipping local variables that we need 
in scope. So let's see what happens if I run this funk test. Oh my goodness, it works. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take out the putzes um, and then try running more tests because it's not enough for just funk.was to be working. But that was the problematic one um, because it's doing all this exotic stuff around implicit and explicit type definitions. But now let's run all of them and see how far it gets. Probably not all the way. Come on. Come on, float expressions. You got this. Come on, const. Oh, it's gonna work. Yes. Fantastic. All right, well, I guess I don't need any of those putzes. Yes, I and mean, it was a surprise when the whole suite passes. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Um, but not for any, you know, computer science reason, just because Life is rarely that good, but you know, even a stopped clock is right twice a day. Great. Okay. I mean, it seems so innocuous, but that feels like quite a hard one change. So, uh, what did I do previously? Okay. Okay. Look up. Local identifier? Function identifier, global identifier, yeah. Look up local identifier in identifier context during parsing. Okay, so that means that we don't need to know the name of a local anymore. So what, how does that shake out? So here we've got these locals and we give them a name. So what happens if I just delete that? Uh, I expect the caller cares. Yeah, so we map. So I would say that here, there's no information to return. I mean, why do we even have, like, I think, I think you can almost just remove locals now Because I don't think that the interpreter needs to know about them anymore. Oh, it needs to know how many there are. Does it though? don't know that it does actually. Okay, well look, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things we can do here. Um, 
I would say that the most immediate change we can make here is that this doesn't need to be an association list anymore. It can just be a flat array because we should never be looking things up by name. Um, so let's find that. So here, local get, it's just stack.push. I mean, this is the same change that we made for global get, right? Uh, uh, how do I want to, I think I have to do this change. I'm trying to think, how can I make this stop being an association list? But I think I have to, I have to get rid of the, the string clause first. And then I can get rid of the association list. So, uh, and then this can just be stack dot push value. Um, okay, so does that work? No, because I typed stash. How interesting. Okay, this is already looking hopeful. I think it would have blown up. Local variables are pretty fundamental. So let's look at evaluate instruction. Oh, okay. So previously, I I made the change in the same. In the same commit, but this time I haven't done that. Yeah, I guess it was a small change in those cases. Um, oh, and also it was necessary to fix it up on the other side. I remember. Because they were all strings before, and then I made them all integers. Oh, right. So what I did here was, maybe this is what I'll do, just for consistency with before. So here I did it in like a single maneuver. I replaced the association list with just a flat array, and then I changed the code that uses it. So maybe I'll do that. Let's try that. Um, because it's kind of gross what... Uh, code that's here. So if I get rid of the square brackets, oh, and this is going to have to become that. Uh, yeah, I did, had to do the same with global set. Um, so yeah, where does that association list get created? In here, essentially. So I don't need to do map name anymore. I just need, well, and this is debatable, but we really just need the right number of zeros for now. And then parameters here doesn't need to be zipped up with argument values anymore. 
it's just a flat array of argument values. Actually, parameters there is not doing any lifting at all. Now, why do I need to get parameter names? Right, so this is looking at the type definitions. Um, I actually don't need the names at all. But that's a separate problem, I think. I think I've done the work there to convert it from an association list. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a small enough unit of work. I, I, I think that's actually, this is tidier than, than breaking it into two pieces, I think, because this is really a, an atomic change where it's like we change the data structure and we change the code that uses it and everything becomes quite a lot simpler. Okay, so what was this? Replace association list of locals with array in interpreter. And let's just say, as with, as we did with globals, we no longer need to look locals up by name because the abstract syntax parser replaces symbols with numeric indexes during parsing. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think I can tick this. Look up local variables and identify a context. Um, there's clearly some cleaning up to do here. Uh, I'm just trying to decide how much of it I want to do uh, versus just like leave it for another day because I would quite like to look at Chris's pull request um, like literally the only thing that parameter names is being used for here is to count how many there are um Why don't I just quickly fix this up? Because that's the kind of thing that I'm going to forget about, and it actually is makes it quite a lot simpler. Um, so let's say parameter count equals count parameters function, and then this argument values equals stack dot pop parameter count. So this get parameter names becomes count parameters. I assume that's the only caller. Yeah. Well, this can be arity. That's the more conventional name for the number of parameters. I mean, these, these functions have like a result arity as well. I'm not quite sure what the right word for that is. But normally, if you ask someone, what's the arity of, you know, addition, they'll say it's binary because it takes two arguments. Um, and the fact that it produces one result is, well, it's a, not an interesting cul-de-sac of mathematical conversation. But the point is, arity is a fine word to use here. Um, so let's count the count them. Um, so if the type index is nil, well, that's never going to be the case. Hold on. Sorry, I keep forgetting whether I've suspended Vim or not. This that is never a thing. The type index is not nil. That is not acceptable. <laughs> um, right. 
Right, well, that's okay, because that's inside parse function, but everyone else should get over it. Uh, so this is stop checking for uh, type index dot nil in get parameter names. Um, every function net definition always has a type index now because we generate, because we either find or generate a type definition for any function that doesn't already refer to one. Okay, so that's already simpler. Um, so now we just want to count the parameters. So we're going to get the type by looking in the type definitions, correct. If the function parameters are empty, then we map with nil. What? Oh, right, this is deciding whether we're using the inline, right, because we care about the names, but we do not anymore care about the names. All we care about is type.parameters.length. <laughs> that is how you count the parameters. So that's much better. And we're now in a much better situation for doing this last thing, which is actually decide the return type of a function properly, which maybe I'll do now because it's a small job um, and it removes a hack that I'd until now sort of forgotten was there. Uh, and I will, I'm liable to forget again. Okay, great. I mean, is this even worth having its own? I suppose it's okay. If this, if this wasn't already in a separate method, I would be tempted to just do that in line, but it's fine. I mean, I'm really tempted to say that we don't need to know how many locals this function has. Because it doesn't matter, you know, if it indexes off the end of this locals, because where we're storing the values at the moment, we're initializing them all to zero, but we can just do that lazily. We can say, make this an array that when you try to read from it, we initialize it that location to zero. So I'm really skeptical about whether we need to know. Let's just look at the structure here. Is there any clue about whether we should particularly care about whether a function has any locals or not? Uh, saying we need to know the types of the locals. Well, a vector of mutable local variables and their types. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just a collection of types. So maybe that is maybe that is worth having. But at the moment, I don't think we've remembered the types of the locals. Yeah, so it's not even doing that. I might just remove the remove the name from the locals because just to demonstrate that we're not using it anywhere, and then but I'll keep the node there so that we can put the type in it if we if we if and when we decide we need to. Um,
so this is I'll, I'll just say uh, determine functionality by counting its parameters and I'll say we used to need to know the parameter names so we could populate the associ association list but we don't have one of those anymore so we no longer care cool so how does the oh look this is it's a little unfortunate we've already got arity here uh function results length oh so it does but it uses the inline that looks a lot like it uses the functions inline results declaration not the so maybe that thing i said before about using maybe i already stopped it from using the um the assert return arity yeah i think maybe that was fake news i think i used to use that but I think that hack is, is now gone. Oh, no, hold on. <laughs> well, it, maybe it was secretly a to done, Owen, but uh, I can see now that actually it kind of... I kind of am doing that. Um, well, the reality is you don't need to know. Hmm... Maybe this is okay because no, I think return it's specifically about return, right? Yeah, when unwinding the stack after return. I have definitely not done that correctly. Like this is using function dot results. Basically, I think I should get rid of these inline. Okay, let, let, let's get rid of a few different things. Let's get rid of the name of locals. I think I had that on my stash, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, so what's gonna what's gonna blow up when I do that? What? Surely the parser is trying to populate that yeah so why is that not blowing up oh it just took a long time okay float experts that's my my test case all right so let's just get rid of that look at that name colon name what do i think this is ruby 3.0 uh, right, so this is another place where I'm just discarding the type information, right? Um, so that's a little bit naughty. And I think maybe I can get rid of the parameter names up there as well. So now having done that, right. Okay. So this is expecting to be able to call parse locals and get back a load of names 
or something that it can map over names. Um, well, for now, let's make this like this. So it returns, uh, it returns a two element array of the name and the local, and then this thing is going to return, well, that's not what I wanted, um, nil in the local, because these are anonymous. So this is going to be local names, comma locals, equals parse locals transpose. Um, and then this can be parameters map name plus local names. We only cared about the names anyway. And locals here is just getting plugged into the AST node, but no longer containing any names. No implicit conversion of nil into array. Um, why has that happened? So parse locals should return the result of repeatedly reading that local thing with results well, let's just do some debugging, I suppose. Um, local names. Local names. Locals. Locals. Okay, so what is the problem? Empty, empty. So what are these actually nil? Huh. Right, so maybe it's because it's empty. So this is okay. It's just that it doesn't have the right behavior on an empty list. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't feel particularly good about this. Um, I'm just trying to smuggle those names out of parse local somehow. Um, this is going to be a problem in general, I think, because lots of things are going to need names smuggled out of them. Uh, 
Oh yeah, okay. So if this is the empty array, um, uh, oh goodness, I'm just trying to think of a nice, easy way of doing this. Like I just want to see the test pass and then I'll and then I'll think about how to actually make this work. Okay, fine. Um There's no argument to transpose that will help with this. No. Um, I suppose there's a ray. Oops. So I could use that around it. Uh, I think I'll just leave this as it is. I mean, it's not it's not very lovely, but it does the trick. I mean, I how do I want this to work? How about if I just do it uh, imperatively and then no one will have to know. And also that gives me a bit more flexibility to change the shape of that data structure. Uh, so now this can say name local and I can just say local names gets name, locals gets local Let's call this local name. So maybe that's a little bit less contentious. Flow experts. So what have I done there? So what's the change here? I mean, I think there's, there is a specific change here, which is, here, if I were to leave the name on, so I'm just leaving this alone for the sake of making the diff sort of clearer. Um, I think this is about, let's just run the test, but this is like uh, return names and locals separately from parse locals. And then I'll say, this will allow us to remove names from the local, well, to remove the name from the local AST node. Let me let the test finish running so I make sure I haven't broken anything. Uh, 
Okay. Right, and then that is just literally remove the name. <laughs> That's better. Okay, remove name from local AST node as with global and function. As with global and function in previous commits, the interpreter doesn't need to know the names of locals anymore. Great. Um, is there anything else obvious that we should do in terms of cleanup here? Don't think so. I'm not going to get rid of locals entirely here because it does need to, it is going to need to know the type later on. So I might as well leave a place for that type to, to live, even though right now it doesn't live there. Um, and, and this thing about unwinding the stack after return. Well, okay, look, I don't think that the function needs parameters and results anymore. It just needs a type index because that reference is the type definition that the function is using. So I think what I'm going to do is well, we need to make it so that no one is saying function.results. It's just these two places, okay. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna have to do this again. <laughs> Um, in fact, look, why don't I just hoist this out and then I, uh, I'm just going to get rid of this. Because I need, I need that type down here. Is that, is that still fine? Um, because this should be type dot results dot length. Okay, that looks convincing. So maybe, maybe I have done this now because I think that's what as branch target does. I think this is this deals with unwinding the stack and it needs to know the arity, the correct arity so that it knows how many values to pop off the stack. Um, and now I'm reading that from the from the type definition for the function. So there's two changes here. Um, there's that one. So this is just inline count parameters in invoke function. We need to know the type later in this method to determine the arity of the function or the result arity of the function from its type definition so we might as well inline this code and leave type assigned leave the definition assigned to type so we can reuse it 
Okay. Um, and then the other change is this. So whatever I just said. Uh, uh, what is it? Use functions type definition or to determine its result arity. And then I can just say every function now has a corresponding type definition pointed to by its type index. So we can always use that instead of hoping there will be an inline type definition. There'll, there'll be an inline list of result types. Okay, so I was looking for function dot results. Oh yeah, there's one down here. So I think we have to do the same thing here. So, it's unclear to me, well, yeah, it's a separate problem. It's unclear to me whether we need this separate mechanism here, because return is not special, but whatever. I'll, I'll think about that another time. Um, so that appears to be working, doesn't it? I'll just run it again for good luck. Um, I'm just going to amend this commit, actually, because I think that's the same. Like we're doing the same thing in both places. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not called function.rb, it's called ast.rb. So if there's any justice, I'll be able to just do that and remove them. Uh, presumably the parser is trying to, <laughs> well, yeah, there we go. So actually, does anyone care about This thing I did here. Well, we need to know how. M I don't think anyone cares about results. Because that's not part of the AST node anymore. So I can get rid of this. but we care about results up until this point because we need them to generate the type if necessary. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's okay.
So this is something like, well, remove parameters and results from function AST mode. Um, by the time the AST is produced, the parser will have arranged for every function's type index to point to a valid type definition, which contains this information. Okay, so that's quite good. Not only have we got rid of the names of functions, but we've also slimmed down, you know, we've still got, we're still implementing exports with a field on the function, which isn't quite right, but we've got the type index, the locals and the body, which is pretty much what the spec says, type locals body. So even though locals at the moment is sort of a bit, it's not doing anything useful, um, that's okay. Now, can I remove the name from type? And can I remove the name from parameter? What happens if I remove the name from parameter? Like, I'm sorry, this is quite tedious, but this is all just clean up from the change I've just made. Okay, so yeah, understandably, the parser expects to be able to Okay, so we've got the same problem here as we had with locals. So I'm going to do the same transformation again, which is to have us return the name along with the parameter. Uh, nil along with the parameter. And then I think it's just parse function that calls parse parameters. Well, I was wrong about that because parse type calls it as well. Oh, parse type use. Oh, it's used all over the place. Parse type use is the one that I was concerned about. Um, well, I'm just going to have to do this business. This is pretty ugly, but I think this is what's necessary to to dump name from the AST node. So let's just do what's necessary. I think this is gonna have to say parameter names. Does anyone actually need the parameters? Oh yeah, I need the, yeah, I just said I need them to, I mean, actually I just need the types. The parameters themselves don't even need an AST node anymore as I think I already wrote a to do for. Hmm. 
maybe not. Um, let's do a to-do for it. Get rid of parameter and result AST nodes if they're just types. Um, so this is saying parameter names from type use. And then this can just be parameter names. So actually, oh, I guess if I don't get the, I'm starting to feel that all of this stuff belongs in parse type use because it really is, this really is just about parsing the type use and it does involve modifying the, it's the type use specifically that involves modifying the identifier context and producing a new type for the, a generated type for the AST. Um, but nonetheless, What was I trying to do? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out if I haven't got good parameters back. So if there weren't any inline ones, then I won't have any parameter names. I need to get them from the type def. So all the way through this, in this arm of the conditional, parameter names is good. Owen says, never clear on what a type use actually was, supposing like an assignment expression, but for typing. So a type use is what WebAssembly specification calls, well, you write a type, well, yeah, I mean, the words are all a bit, the words are all a bit screwed up. Um, in a module, when you write a type, that is a, that is what I've been calling a type definition. So when you write down a type, that is actually defining a type. And then there's a separate thing called a type use, which is a reference to a type definition. So having defined a type, you can then use it somewhere. And syntactically, it looks very similar. You're still putting type inside brackets like this, but instead of saying type with an ID and then an actual parameter and results, you're just saying type and then either a symbol or a, or a number to refer to the type definition that you want to use at that point. And I mean, the most significant place where you wanna do that and what we've been dealing with is in function definitions. So in a function definition, you say, I want to make a function called foo, and then I'm going to refer to a type use. And a type use is usually type followed by a type ID. We, we were literally just looking at this. Um, but the reason this has been so problematic is that as an abbreviation, you can just give in, an inline type and that's what triggers this synthesizing a new type definition and inserting the index to that new synthesized definition and all of that stuff that I've been dealing with. Um, 
unfortunately, this appears to be the common case. Like in a lot of the tests I've been running, they just have these inline types and they don't even have a type index. So I managed to get this far without ever thinking about this. But now I've hit some tests that actually do expect that you that you follow this spec to the letter. Um, but yeah, the short version, too long didn't listen. A type use is just mentioning a type in a function definition. Um, but yes, the, the concepts are all a little bit, are all a little bit mixed together, I'm afraid. Um, so what I was saying was that here, the parameter names are good because we haven't been given a type index. So either we're going to find one or we're going to synthesize one. And in neither case are we going to get any names from it. So in this branch, the names are good. Here, this is saying we haven't been given any parameters, but we do have a type index. So we look it up. And I think here I have to say parameter names equals parameters. Oh, my typing is really going downhill. Map nil, because we still need to have the names, but we need them to all be nil, but they have to take their positions in this locals uh, index space in the identifier context. Um, so that the locals have the right indexes. So if we don't have names for any of the parameters, we still have to pad out this parameter names with the, when parameters changes value, we have to make sure that parameter names changes with it. Uh, I don't believe parameters changes value in any of this because this, this whole arm of the conditional is just using the value that we got from parse type use. Um, so who else uses parse parameters? Yeah, unfortunately, this is gonna... Oh, maybe this can just be map name parameter parameter So that's just going to throw away the names. And this also wants to throw away the names. In fact, let's make that underscore so that it doesn't mess with. We've already got a local called name there and I don't want to I don't want to risk it. Same here actually. So has that broken anything? Yes. Oh. Oh, right, well. We're gonna do that last. Okay, so this is looking okay. So this is gonna be return names and parameters separately from parse parameters. And I'm just gonna say, this will allow us to remove the name from the parameter AST node. Okay, and then let's do it. Hmm. 
remove name from parameter AST node. Looking good. Um, what other unnecessary stuff is there? So the results don't have names, the parameters don't now no longer have names, and the locals now no longer have names. The functions we've removed are the parameters and the results. I think that's probably enough for now. Um, although maybe I need to remove the name from type. Let's just look at that quickly. It's only in these places. How much does parse type care? Parse types callers. Uh, not at all. I think that maybe nobody ever looks at this. because we take care of it in up here. So this is where we care about the name of the type. So I, I, I think it might not matter to anyone anymore now that the interpreter isn't trying to look it up. Well, look, we've... We've got the parameters and results. Um, yeah, actually, this type def does just turn into a function type. Um, yeah, that yeah, and that that name was just left left over. Um, it used to be that the interpreter would look it up by name. I think. Oh, is that true? The interpreter doesn't care about types. Well, maybe it was using it. Maybe it was using it to look at the to resolve indexes. So if there if there was a type use that used a symbolic name, it would go and look at it would go and find the type with that name, but. We don't do that anymore, so I don't think it's necessary. So I'll just say remove name from type AST node, and I'll just say nobody is using this anymore. Cool. I mean, this is really, well, I guess it is sort of, I guess it is abstract syntax. Um, like all of these places now, This should really be an instance of type, I think, because now type is this this AST node that I've sort of hypothecated, hypothesized the existence of rather. Um, this is now just a function type. It's just a little package for parameters and results.
and it can still participate in this pattern match, so that's fine. Uh, fetch, that's not right. Uh, it's got a getter now. Uh, right, okay, well this is much nicer. I think we should make this just type now. Okay. Uh, I wonder if I've got any other weird hashes hanging around. Presumably not. I think that's probably it. In build initial context, we have to we have to make those. When we find type we have to make one of these and then add them add them to the context oh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go and rename everything oh maybe I am Um, so yeah, I think this was, this is the only customer of it. Um, uh, Um, is there anything else to think about here? I think that's it. I mean, the tests are passing, so what else is there in, in life? Uh, use type AST node to represent, um, Well, function function types essentially. Um, this might not be the right thing to use. This might not be the right name for it, but this is its purpose at the moment. So we should use it for that everywhere. So I think like all the places that parameters and results are being packaged up together, they should live in this thing that we currently call type and maybe it should be called function type or whatever. Yeah, okay. Um, is there anything else? So we got rid of name from type. Uh, got, got rid of all kinds of junk from the AST as a result of this. I mean, it was quite laborious to get that change done. Uh, I'm going to take this because I've done all that. 
Um, oh, and also we should say push uh, type use uh, lookup including generated type definition into parse type use. Right. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to switch gears and have a look and, and think about Chris's pull request. I'm sure he is fast asleep now, but Chris, if I send you a link to this bit in the video, I reckon you'll probably watch it. So let's, let's look at that now. Um, the thing is, Chris's pull request, which I still haven't read, apart from the subject line of it, so I know vaguely what it's about, um, made me think about, yeah, what I want to do about contributions in general. Because uh, I think I should probably... This is this is nothing to do with Chris. It's just, you know, it's, it's all to do with me thinking about, like, oh, what should I... Should I be encouraging people to open pull requests? Should I be telling people not to open pull requests? Like, what's the right thing to do? And I think in the weeks that I've had to think about it since Chris opened that PR, I think I've I have settled down on a on a sort of opinion about it, which is that I do want people to contribute stuff, but I want them to and I, I Chris already understands this. I want random people who might want to contribute stuff to understand that what they're doing is like making a suggestion like it's like an alternative to to joining the live chat and saying something so it's like a richer and more asynchronous channel of communication and if they want to tell me about a bug that I've got then they could open an issue and if they want to show me a different way of doing something they can open a pull request and like use github's features to communicate uh, richer information to me about what it is that they are suggesting that probably wouldn't fit in a live chat comment. And so having realised that that's how I feel about it and that's how I want to run things, I think I should write it down in like a... What is it? Contributing.md? Oh. <laughs> well, that'll teach me how to use a computer. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Oh, for God's sake. That's <laughs> literally the first, of course, that's the first result. Okay. Okay, where's... You, you, come on, GitHub. What I want to know is where in my repo can I put one? Um... Wow, I wasn't expecting it to be this hard to find. Um, add a contributing file to the root of your repository. And this blog post looks, oh, that's from 2012, okay. Um, GitHub, adding contributing guidelines. Here we go. I was obviously remiss in searching for, I was searching for the wrong thing is what I'm trying to say. Um, Oh, root docs or dot github folder. That's nice. Oh yeah, okay. Owen says they're at the root. Um Yeah, I guess I'll probably put it in the root. I was previously thinking I put it in the dot github folder so that it's like not, you know, hanging around being all conspicuous in the root of the project, but I think maybe that's a good thing. Um, I mean, I've obviously got a problem here, which is that I've, the, the structure of this project is just a flat directory and it should probably not be, I should have a lib folder and a test folder and all that kind of stuff. And that's just never, I've just never prioritized it. Um, it's on my to-do list somewhere. Uh, this, the size of the scroll bar on my to-do list has got, become a little intimidating. Um, 
But yeah, I've got the license here, so maybe I should have a contributing.md. Um, Oh, I guess it's up to me whether I make it markdown or not, isn't it? My readme is not... Oh, I don't have a readme. My license isn't... Can the license be marked down? I don't know. See, this is the kind of horrible decision that I don't want to make. I mean, look, this says to make your contributing guidelines visible in the repository root directory, type contributing, but that's not what this is saying. It's saying contributing.md. <laughs> I mean, I think it says here, files are rendered in rich text format for file extensions in a supported format. Um, Oh, I should have thought about this, shouldn't I? Because now I'm just, now I'm going back and forth in my mind about whether I want it to be a markdown or not. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to make it plain text for now because otherwise I'll be here all day. Okay, what do I want to say here? I'm just going to free associate and then I can clean it up. Uh, this project is free software, but not conventional open source. Its primary output is video, not code. So the goal is to record myself writing everything rather than collect community contributions. Uh, I want to say, I do have to say something about how I'm, it's probably going to take me ages to get to them. <laughs> uh, issues and pull requests are welcome as a rich async alternative to the streams live chat. I won't merge PRs because I don't want to break the streak of every line of code was written on the stream, but I'm happy to receive PRs, well, issues and PRs which report bugs, make suggestions, or show examples of how the code might be improved. Uh, when writing a PR, bear in mind that I might only read the description, not the code, to avoid spoilers. It will probably also take me a while <laughs> uh, to get around what's the right way to say this uh, yeah Owen says it's pretty distinct that this project is more about open learning than open source software yeah that's a good that's a good way of putting it I suppose open learning yeah I mean obviously I am I am writing software but I'm not <laughs> I don't know why I'm so resistant to the idea, but I just hate the idea of having to be responsible for any kind of open source governance, like the idea of having to, you know, arbitrate over whether one person's contribution is, you know, good enough to make it into the project or whatever. Like, I think people who run open source projects have a degree of like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. They're just better people than I am, basically. They're they're able to make those kinds of decisions and use their judgment, whereas I just, 
yeah, I can't. <laughs> I don't want to be in that position. I don't want to be the person who's deciding whether this pull request is good enough or not. Um, just because it's a, you know, it's like a socially awkward situation, basically. Like someone has, someone's found a bug or they've written some code and they want to help. And then you're like throwing it back in their face and saying, I don't want your help. Do it again. <laughs> Do it right this time. I just, that's never sat very well with me. And that's why I do not, that's one of the many reasons why I don't maintain a successful open source project is because I don't have the temperament for it. And also I'm just an impatient and ill-tempered person in general. So, you know, I, I probably shouldn't be inflicting myself on, <laughs> on those generous contributors of the world. Um, I want to find a way to say here, basically it's going to take me ages to get around to it. Um, uh, Uh, based on, well, uh, maybe I don't need to. I feel like that's a little bit, that's a bit, a little bit passive aggressive to say like, oh, by the way, it'll take me ages to get to it. Like, people always take ages to get to issues and pull requests, don't they? Like, I think I'm, I think there's sufficient risk that what I'm saying here is off-putting that I don't want to make it any more off-putting. Uh, so I'll just say, I'm grateful for all audience participation. So thank you in advance. Right. I think that's fine. Um... Um, okay. What do they call them? Contribution guidelines. Add project contribution guidelines. Uh, I've put this in the, I've, I've called this file contributing and put it in the root of the repo as suggested by GitHub. Um, I might decide to make it marked down later, but for now, I just wanted to write a few words, not make decisions about formatting. Okay, that's that done. Um, well, I haven't written a contributing.md, but I've written a contributing, so that's close enough. Um, right, well, having made a massive meal of it, now let's look at Chris's pull request. This is the exciting part, Chris. Um, make loop more like block. Okay, so before I read any, that is, the, that's the extent of what I've read so far. So it's nice to remind myself. Um, so let's have a look, or rather, let's, let me remind myself what he's talking about. So, Okay, so this as branch target is like, well, it's a bad name, really. This is more like handle branch or like with branch handler. In fact, maybe that's what I should call it. Because as branch target doesn't tell me anything. But really what this is, is... It, you give it a block and it yields to that block inside a catch. And then if that, <laughs> if that block throws this branch symbol, 
then it will do something. <laughs> um, what will it do? Oh, I've just realized I, this is another place where I should get rid of, I should be using the identifier context to get rid of all these strings and just make them all integers. But so that would definitely simplify this. Um, sorry, I'm just going to write that down while I remember. Uh, use identifier context to replace symbolic labels. Well, to replace branch. To replace, yeah, symbolic labels with integers. Um, but anyway. Because at the moment, this is being done at runtime, but actually it should be being... <laughs> these. Um, you can see that here, if you... If it wasn't zero that was thrown, then this re-throws it and subtracts one from it, which is... Well, maybe that's how it will... That, maybe that's still how it will work, but actu actually, but just this bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Just this bit is unnecessary. At parse time, I could actually, rather than having, because the, the integers when you do a branch are just how many scopes you want to jump out. Um, <clears throat> uh, but actually, the parser could just statically resolve that to which enclosing scope it's trying to jump to, and then like synthesize a symbolic label or. <clears throat> So actually it could go the other way, because in, in some ways this is easier to deal with. Um, anyway, uh, oh yeah, Owen's saying I just merge all PRs, then never get around to fix-ups and cutting releases. Yeah, I guess that's one way to run an open source project is <clears throat> just press merge on everything. And then, <laughs> you know, if, if, if a pull request is merged in the forest and there's no one around to release it, then did it really happen? Um... Okay, so this, this branch handler is the thing that's wrapping a block, and if that block tries to branch, then it deals with it. And what that means is it fiddles about with the stack, according to the, semant the operational semantics of WebAssembly, um, and then, yeah, it, it re-throws that symbol if necessary. Um, what on earth does the Boolean... Re result of this mean who knows oh I suppose it's whether it whether a branch happened yeah branched equals yeah okay so maybe this is what maybe that this is what Chris is talking about is that I've I've had to make with branch handler return a boolean to say whether it branched or not. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can understand why he's um, why he's picking on this because with a bit of distance from it, it is quite weird. So there's an infinite loop here. So <laughs> Ruby has got this inf has got an infinite loop in it. WebAssembly's loops are like the opposite in that they're not loops at all. Um, if you don't branch at the end to go back to the beginning, then the loop just stops. So there's no, <laughs> there really is no loop unless you put a branch at the end of it. Um, so to patch up that mismatch, what I've had to do is get back a Boolean that tells me whether a branch happened. And if it didn't, then we break out of the loop. <laughs> so that's quite strange. And I assume that that's what Chris's pull request is about. So let's see. Previously, the WASM... Oh, it was only 11 days ago. It feels like a lot longer ago than that. Uh, it's not so bad, is it? I don't know why I'm beating myself up so much, Chris. Um, 
Previously, the WASM loop instruction was implemented with a Ruby loop keyword. Yes, loops, uh, so this is what you're saying. Loops in WASM are different to loops in Ruby. They exit by default and only repeat if you branch them within the loop. See, I didn't need to explain this. He's already explained it all. It's very good, Chris. Um, if you're used to, used to loops in Ruby, this is rather counterintuitive. To make this work with the loop keyword, the code had to break out of the loop if no branches occurred. This makes my head spin and even led to a head in the hand moment on the stream when it defeated Tom Stewart's attempt at a refactor. <laughs> Am I going to do this? Am I going to click this link? Let's, this is getting pretty meta, isn't it? I'm I'm not going to turn the sound on, but I I don't mind watching this guy for a minute. Although I don't know how long this uh, I don't know how long this bit is going to be. Let's skip ahead and see if we can find the head in hand moment. <laughs> okay, yes. All right, Chris, that is definitely a head in hand moment. You are you are correct. I can't I can't debate that. <laughs> all right very good fine <laughs> all right i was clearly not happy you are correct uh instead let's try to handle loop instructions like blocks the difference between blocks and loops in wasm is that branching to a block branches to the end of the block branching to a loop branches to the start of the loop the WASM spec calls this a forward jump and a backward jump, respectively. Uh, why does it say that? I mean, I'm, I'm extremely familiar with the fact that you can't actually link to the bit that you want to link to. Ah, the exact effect depends on that control construct. In in case of block or if, it is a forward jump, resuming execution after the matching end. In case of loop, it is a backward jump to the beginning of the loop. Right. Right you are, Chris. Okay. The good news is that Ruby has a way to backward jump, the redo statement. The slightly bad and awkward news is that it only works within blocks. So I've used define method to make the as branch target method a block and redoable. Maybe there's a nicer way to do this. Also note a similar thing could be achieved with the retry keyword if we threw and rescued an exception. Oh, this is very interesting. I like how this removes the need for the Ruby loop and makes the code better reflect the key difference between wires and blocks and loops. As a bonus, the return value is of, of, of as branch target is now not needed anywhere. Yes, I would love that. I would love that. I had forgotten about redo. So, I understand that there's code inside this PR. I have, this is, I have seen a pull request before, but I'm now just thinking about what Chris has said. So I, I think what Chris is suggesting I mean I've renamed this method to be called with branch handler now. In fact, why don't I well I'm not gonna commit that until I've actually got something to until I've actually got something to do. No, I'm gonna commit it. I'm I'm pretty convinced that that is a better name. Um, so what is this rename as branch target to with branch handler? When I came back to this method as part of thinking about number two, uh, I couldn't really remember what it did and I think the name was part of that I am hopeful that uh, 
with branch handler will make it more obvious to me in future what this method does. Okay, so I've used define method to make the as branch target method a block and redoable. To make the method a block and redoable. Oh, I think. So I think he's talking about making the body of this method redoable. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to torture myself here, but I, I genuinely want to, I suppose selfishly what I'm trying to do is sort of try and think it through myself. Cause I could just, I could just look at the code in Chris's pull request, but I'm, what I'm struggling with is trying to work out how the coordination works because this, okay. What, what I'm trying to say is with branch handler doesn't know whether it's a loop or a block, right? So it's just, it just calls yield here. Now maybe what Chris is saying is that if you call redo from inside the block, from inside the yield here, then it like, I mean, how, how does this even work? Um, I mean, you can make a block by just doing, you know, begin, puts, hello, redo, end. Can't escape from eval with redo. Well, maybe you can't do that then. I thought you could. Um, I mean, you can do like, Something like that, right? So I don't understand why you can't can't escape from eval with redo. Like, is that just an IRB problem? Invalid redo. Okay, well. So, ah, oh, this is, Chris, it's so tempting to look at your code because I, I mean, admittedly it's one o'clock in the morning, so my brain is not exactly firing on all cylinders, uh, which maybe, um, maybe I should have looked at this, you know, at the beginning of a stream rather than once my, all my neurotransmitters were depleted. But I'm just trying to puzzle through like, the body of the with branch handler method doesn't know whether it's being used inside a block or a loop, right? So you must be talking about doing something at this level, because this is where we know whether it's a block or a loop. And 
was saying the re return value was not needed anyway. So basically you're getting rid of this and presumably getting rid of this loop. And somehow, somehow you're making it so that when a branch happens inside this, we redo, we redo the block. But when a branch happens inside this, we exit the block. But how are you passing some kind of jump direction? Like, you know, a, a, is there some kind of like, uh, you know, jump forwards, and then this is like jump backwards. Like, is that how it works? Like, because I, I don't. I, I'm just gonna work. I'm I'm just like thinking out loud and coding out loud. Uh, like if we did that. apparently want it to be called direction. I don't know why. Um, so let's just say that that's the code we want to be able to write. We want to be able to say, oh, direction is clearly a worse name than jump because it's very hard to understand what that, what that argument means otherwise. So, So I suppose what I'm thinking is, yeah, okay, so we're not using the return values anymore. But I'm sort of imagining that here it's sort of like, you know, redo if jump equals backwards, something like that. You know, so sort of pushing the, the responsibility for the loop into, like basically, making it so that the branch handler knows whether to jump forwards or backwards. Um, and of course, jumping forwards is just what happens anyway when control exits the block. But jumping backwards is, yeah. Uh, so... Chris was talking about, I mean, this is, I might have got the wrong end of the stick, but this is literally the only thing I can think of, because, like, I don't understand how this decision gets made. I don't understand where the redo goes um, if you don't do it like this. And you can't, it can't be in the block that you pass to the with branch handler, because it doesn't, this block doesn't know when uh, when a branch is going to happen. So it has to be in here, I think. But maybe I'm missing a trick about... I mean, obviously, this is not going to work because, as you say, you can't redo the body of a... Oh, wow, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> that, uh, that really crashed hard. Segfort. Well, that's one for me to... That's one for me to report. This is a preview release of Ruby, it's fine. Um, anyway, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but Chris was suggesting if we use define method with branch, branch handler do um, 
I'm not sure how these key work though. Well, they wouldn't work, would they? Uh, what? Let's just make them positional. I don't. You can't. <laughs> yeah, that second thought was a, a little, a little intimidating at this, at this hour. Um, So let's just, just for the sake of argument. So nil. Blah. Forward. Label. Oh. Oh yeah, I'm going to need to change all of these. Um, results length forwards label results length backwards and then this is label results length forwards okay so yeah I think it's quite likely that I've diverged from what Chris intended here but this is my sort of rudimentary understanding of what he's suggesting is that we can trigger a backwards jump when we know that it's desirable and I think the only way that we can know that is if we pass in some information about the jump direction um I mean this isn't great is it <laughs> uh I mean, I, I assume it's the redo that's causing that problem. Um, I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> oh, interesting. So hold on. Okay, so that's all okay. So what part of this is causing Ruby to freak out? Uh, okay, not that. I mean, I'm actually kind of curious about what's provoking that seg for. Um, wow. That's extremely, I mean, I guess it's just a bug. I guess there's just a bug in Ruby. Um, however, this does present something of a challenge. <laughs> Um, it's like, is it unhappy with define method? That's very odd, isn't it? Uh, okay, well, how do I, how do I proceed? Uh, again, given that my main priority here is just to, uh, I don't know, learn something. Um, so far all I've learned is that define method is crashy. Okay, so let's back out of all of those argument changes. Okay, so now presumably it's the redo that's making it freak out. I mean, really all bets are off at this point, aren't they? It doesn't look like I can even get redo to work. Um, let's just try this out. Define method foo do puts hello redo. Okay, so at least that works. 
um, perhaps it interacts badly with the fact that we're catching or something. Um, what happens if this is just an unconditional redo? Nope. So we can just do something like nil dot tap do redo end. That's basically an infinite loop, right? So can I do that in here? Well, I can just do it on self, right? I think he would jump. Yeah, I should actually read the error message, shouldn't I? Forwards. Okay, so it's sitting in that infinite loop, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that this whole situation is a little bit regrettable, isn't it? With the, so I think I can just say tap here. Okay, that's fine. Um, just trying to think, what's the most boring method? Like then? I'm just trying to think of... Oh, it needs to be self.then. Should I think of like, what is the most boring way to evaluate a block once? Maybe it is tap. Is there anything else that's like, you know, you can do like one times. I'm just trying to think of excuses to, yeah, yield self. I mean, there's that, there's object itself, but I don't think that takes a block, does it? No. Maybe yield self is nice. Okay, so let's think about what happens if all of this is glued inside here. So I think this is what was, well, this is my weird interpretation of what Chris suggested. Hey, that works. it slower I can't really tell I suppose I suppose that that's measurable isn't it okay um let's just tell that that felt slower than usual but I don't know how to I don't know that I can trust my lying eyes I'm sorry, this, this bit is just waiting now. Um, I hope you're having a nice day. I know I am. Okay. I mean, it's pretty slow, isn't it? Even without that change.
Okay. I mean, yeah, 37.8 seconds. It felt like a lot longer than that. Ah, oh, and you've got your dinner in the oven. Very good. Well, I think you're you're doing better than me. Um, okay, so we're looking for 37.8 seconds. Oh, yeah, this isn't... I don't think this is actually any slower. It just felt like it was pausing for a long time, but I think that's because my pause is really slow. And I just haven't sat and watched this tick along like this for a while, but it's actually getting quite slow. Uh, so... You know, before I open the door on this advent calendar that Chris has provided... Oh, look, it's actually a bit faster. It's actually a few seconds faster. Very nice. So this is definitely an improvement because, as Chris says, we now no longer need... We no longer need the return values. Um, so I think this is already an improvement. It's just what I'm hesitating about is whether whether this is what Chris meant because I don't want to let him down I think I well for the not well I was going to say I think I prefer using something like yield self to I prefer that to using define method um, so Owen says in the PR he mentions the handler method may not be needed so let's look at this again let's try to handle loop instructions like blocks Ruby has a backward jump the slightly bad and awkward news is that it only works within blocks so I've used define method to make the as branch target method a block and redoable. Yeah, so I mean, maybe that's, maybe the inter maybe your interpretation, Owen, is that he sort of got rid of the method and has used a block instead of the method. But I think, I think that what this means is that he's used define method to define this method, um, but made its body a block. Um, it's a shame that this doesn't, that that doesn't seem to work here. It's just making me realize that I don't know how keyword arguments work with define method. And so therefore I'm going to look it up. Uh, I guess that's in, I guess define method is in module. Because that is the land where methods live. Defines an instance method in the receiver. The method params can be a proper method or an unbound method object. Uh, if a block is specified, it's used as a method body. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I just don't know. <laughs> this is one of the things I don't know about Ruby. If you held a gun to my head, I wouldn't be able to tell you if it's possible to yield keyword arguments to a block. I don't think it is, but stuff changes in Ruby. Um, and I don't keep up with it necessarily. Um, control expressions. Use redo to redo the current iteration. 
Yeah, it doesn't really say anything about that, does it? So like, what what happens if I try to use begin? Because that is that was my first, that was my go to. You can use begin and end. Oh wow, Owen, you're not even a a Ruby programmer. Okay, well I appreciate your <laughs> patience in watching a programming language that is uh, that is not familiar to you. So what happens if I put this inside a begin? Um, it didn't work in IRB. It didn't work when I just ran it in MRI. And it, well, now it's seg faulting. Okay, right. So for whatever reason, which may be a bad reason, uh, that's not going to work. So I'll stick with yield cell for now. Um, I was hoping there might be something in here about blocks, but there isn't. Maybe that's in syntax. Uh, anyway, sorry, this is a this is a distraction. Um, I think this is an improvement. Uh, I just don't I don't love the API. I don't love having to pass in this jump forwards. Um, I wonder if it's possible. So I'm just curious to see if it's possible to plug in a proc here. So can I do like jump dot call and less jump nil? And then make this nil by default i mean jump isn't the right name for it but that's just that's the parameter that i had i don't know what i think i'm doing again i think i'm um, probably getting a bit tired um like can you do this even though you're not in the right lexical scope? I mean, that seems incredibly unlikely to work, doesn't it? Because that redo is inside a different block. Holy crap. That does actually work. Wow. Oh, he says, I don't think it does work. <laughs> uh, I think this is the first, this was the first test that actually has a loop in it. So it doesn't work. So that was, I had a real moment of confusion there because I wasn't expecting it to work. And indeed it doesn't. So it got all the way down to float experts or whatever. Um, I think I'm going to commit this because I think Chris's fundamental genius here was suggesting sticking with branch handler inside a block. And I've done that. I mean, can redo travel through? I 
Well, I don't know. I was going to... It makes me realise I don't really know how Redo works at all. It's not... I've basically never used it. So I don't really know. I don't have a good intuition about, like... What happens if you say redo inside a method? Invalid redo. So you can't syntactically put redo inside. It has to be inside a block. Where's this syntax suggest could not find file name from? I don't, whatever that is, I don't want that. Thanks, but no thanks. Um, okay, so you can't, you can't just put redo inside a method and then somehow magically have it redo whatever block you're calling it from. It's kind of lexically bound to its enclosing block. Um, and furthermore, for some reason, the block that's created by begin end is not, doesn't count. Um, well, the reason I didn't get a syntax error is because, yes, that is what you saw own was a kind of closure, but this is actually a sort of syntactic sugar. So if I call that, it will just sit in an infinite loop because it is this is syntactically a block. And another way of writing this is p equals proc.new do redo end. So this kind of stabby lambda syntax, as it's called, and these curly braces are just a tidier way of... There are a couple of differences, but for the purposes of this conversation, it's basically the same as doing this. Um, so actually, syntactically, this is inside a block. It's just inside. In Ruby, you can write blocks with curly braces or you can write them with do end. Um, but you can't just do that. You can't just say do end. Not very regular, really. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is commit this because this is definitely an improvement. Um, yeah, there's no exactly, I think it's, it's basically lexically scoped. Like, you know, it's, it's not, it's not like an exception that can bubble up or anything. It's just like talking to its, its lexically enclosing block. Um, so just have to live with that. Um, so, uh, diff ignore all space so actually I'm going to put those return values back in so that I can remove them if you see what I mean in, in, a, in a separate commit because I really want this to just be Um, uh, the silence is me just sort of procrastinating on whether I should have a better name for the parameter. Maybe it could just be called redo or maybe it could just be called loop. Um, well, I'm just going to I'm just going to commit this because I've got something that works now. So let's say uh, use redo in with branch handler to uh, jump backwards. when in a loop. So let's say uh, this 
approach or something like it <laughs> was suggested by Zeta in two. I'm not sure whether I fully understood his idea, but it definitely makes the whole thing a lot cleaner to be able to redo a block rather than, you know, break unless branched, which makes my brain hurt. Uh, I couldn't find a better way of wrapping the body of the method in a block than using yield self uh, or tap or whatever. Maybe tap is better. Yield self's a bit weird, isn't it? Let's switch it around. Tap. Or yield self or whatever. Let's just switch it for tap. I think yield self is a bit of a weird method. Uh, I couldn't find a better way of wrapping the body on the bottom of the top. Uh, my attempts to use begin, end, and define method have been met with segports from Ruby 3.2.0 Preview 3. So I'm not going to spend any time experimenting until... <laughs> uh, uh, the final release is available. Well, let's say a stable release. Um, what else do I want to say? I don't, I don't love the jump backwards API, but it's still better than what I was doing before. So I'll take the win. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, so now I'm going to remove all of these. So this is remove unused with branch handler return, uh, return value is return value. So what I'll say is this was previously assigned to a local variable called branched when deciding uh, whether to terminate the infinite loop or not. But now that we're using the Zeta maneuver to simply redo the loop body from inside 
with branch handler, we no longer need any return value. Nice. I just had a horrible moment of thinking, is Chris's, have I got Chris's uh, username right? I think I have, yeah. I've already, I've already been to his GitHub profile on this stream. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just on Twitter where he's not Zeta. Because there's a pretender to his Zetarian throne. But it's got Zeta on Ruby Social, so that's all that matters, isn't it? Um, okay. I really like that. I would go so far as to say that that's good. And certainly once I get rid of this, it's just going to be this one occurrence of it. I mean, obviously this, it could just be a Boolean, but I just don't know what to call it. Um, a bit difficult to call it. I mean, I've done this elsewhere, but it's a bit difficult to call things the same name as Ruby keywords. So calling it redo or loop or whatever is not is not totally straightforward I think I'm going to leave that for now um, let's let's open the advent calendar and see what Chris was see what Chris did ah right he did use a boolean branch to sequence start. Oh, and you know, turns out you can just pass <laughs> you can just pass keywords into a block. I should I should have known that, but I've just never tried it. Uh, oh right, and then yields is problematic. Okay. That's quite nice. Branch to sequence start. Yeah, now that I've seen that, I think maybe a Boolean, I mean, I don't know why I couldn't just visualize this, but actually seeing it written down as code does make me think that, well, mainly the thing it makes me think is that providing this argument in all cases is a bit silly. That's the main thing it made me think, because actually there's only one case where we need it. So all of these other cases, we don't need to add anything. That's obviously better. And I can achieve that just by making this, you know, optional. Um, I think I'm going to call this, I think I'm going to call it, I don't know what I'm going to call it. But I'm just fixing this up to be Boolean because I think look, seeing Chris do it has made me think that that's the right thing to do. It's like branch to start. And that's basically the same as what Chris called it. like, you know, redo on branch or something. Maybe that, redo on branch. Yeah, I mean, that's quite, does what it says on the tin. Is that too low level?
but I do like the fact that that has less of an effect on all of the other core sites. I think I am gonna and uh, what else what else is in here? Yeah, okay. So actually, yeah, my after my bit of head scratching at the beginning, it seems like this is what although Chris didn't say it in the pull request description, this is what he had in mind is like you have to be able to tell the block inside the branch handler whether to do whether to redo or not like that was this was the only thing that was doing my head in was like is there somehow a way to inject this from the outside but i just don't think there is so it has to be it has to be data you have to defunctionalize it essentially and just pass in some kind of value that tells it what to do and you know because there are only two things it can do and one of them is do nothing then a boolean is a uh, you know, pretty classic. I've got two possible values data type, isn't it? Um, okay, I think I think I'm gonna stick with this with redo on branch. Just because it's most likely for me to be able to remember what it does without going and reading the implementation. I mean, it's, I do sort of dislike these extremely low level names. I'd rather have a sort of a more abstract name that communicates an idea about the behavior and redo on, redo on branch is basically just like, it's pretty, it's pretty down and dirty with what the code is actually doing. But in this case, I think the additional clarity of it just being named exactly what it does um, will be good for me. Um, so hold on, what am I saying? Uh, replace with branch handler jump argument with boolean with default boolean redo on branch well i don't mean default i mean optional um set a chord this argument branch to sequence start in number two um, uh, Zeta used an optional boolean argument in number two and i really like that idea not least because it means we only need to provide the extra argument in the one case where we want redo to happen he called the argument branch sequence start in his PR, but I've gone with redo on branch because it's the most simple minded name I could possibly think of, which means it's more likely I'll remember what it does in future.
Okay. Thanks, Chris. I think that was well worth the build up. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased that that's that was definitely a a war on this particular uh, bit of code. So to now have that sorted out is um is very nice indeed. Thank you. Um, well, it's pretty late. So I think I'm going to wrap this up now. Uh, oh, yeah, Zeta's PR. Um, is there anything else that I've secretly done? I don't think so. I mean, is this... Have I done this? I mean, here, when I'm unwinding the stack after return, I do use the type definition referred to by the type use. There always is one. Um, what happens with the stack unwinding here? Oh, this is, yeah, this is just about remembering. what the stack height was before the branch happened. I think I've done this. I think I've done so much stuff on type definitions. I can't imagine that when I wrote this, I was thinking of anything more complicated than what I've already done in the course of this session. So I think probably this is this type definition action plan is all done, but I'm sure there are more places. I'm I'm not doing anything with block types, for example, and I need to get into that. So that's, you know, there's definitely more work to be done there. Um, uh, yeah, so like some of the reason why some of these tests aren't working, like loop.wast. is because, oh, actually, well, this is just a syntax error. So I haven't, I can't even parse the, the syntax, which is, um, um Like here, this is a loop that takes a parameter and I just can't, I just, I can't parse that yet. So that's a whole different problem. It looks like all of these need, if I want to get back into this, it looks like if I added, I feel way more, I, I have a much better grasp on how types work now um, in the context of WebAssembly. Um, so I think I'm sort of ready to deal with this kind of situation uh, and the, the corresponding effect on the stack. Like, I think that's all like within my grasp now to understand and implement that. So I think next time I'm going to try and let's say, uh, implement block type with parameters and get loop.wast and what was it if.wast passing yeah i reckon that's doable i'll bump these stretch goals up as well because that's you know that was obviously stuff that i felt like i wanted to do um oh and of course i have to the very important thing to do at the end of every stream is to push my changes up to GitHub and watch the tests pass. Okay. Hopefully Chris will get some notifications about 
these references. Um, hopefully these tests will pass and I will be able to stop. <laughs> looking pretty helpful. It's weird it gets into this state where it's not really producing any output, but it's also not finishing. Maybe it's just maybe it's just in a loop. For some reason I'm more forgiving when this is running on my terminal, but when it's running in the cloud somewhere, it's like, oh, why is this rubbish so slow? Okay. All right. Well. All these buttons stop working when I've been, when I've been, been doing something else for a bit. There we go. Um, well. That was great. Um... Got the ident I got the hardest part. Of what I th what I hope is the hardest part of the identifier context, wired in and working, and I had to sort of deal with a lot of it. Sort of shook out a lot of stuff to do with types and type definitions and modifying the AST during parsing and all of that kind of stuff. So there were lots of interesting little bits and pieces in there that I'm well. Firstly, they were interesting, and I'm glad that I did them. But also, I'm glad that they're done and I don't have to think about it anymore because it, it's it feels like it's settled down into a more stable situation now. So that's really good. I'm very happy I got to Chris's um, PR. It was a really cool idea. I, I would never have thought of that. And yeah, I'm just very happy that that area of the code is less gnarly now. So thanks again, Chris. And anyone else who's... There are clearly a million different ways that this code could be improved. So if you've got any, if, if anyone's got any PRs or issues, um, please do go ahead and follow the instructions in the contributing file um, to find out how it's going to work. Um, but okay, that's it. I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, I'll say bye. <laughs> This never works. I don't understand why that never works. Um, but it says by now. Um, yeah, uh, as I always say, thank you very, very much for watching. I am incredibly grateful. Thanks, Owen, for hanging out in the chat. Thanks, Chris, for the pull request. Um, and if you're not one of those two people, then thank you very much to you for sitting through more of this. I think this was a more interesting one. This felt a bit less of a slog and more like I was actually having to think and figure stuff out and that's what I enjoy so I hope that you got some enjoyment out of it um please join me next time for more of this I'll see you then bye bye